You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. Today, we're thrilled to present our second collection of haunted house stories, as previously featured on the channel, in Walls of the Dead, Volume 2. As a bonus, we've reworked and included our original Karnaki tale, The Haunting at Ravenglass, so that it is presented as a typical story, rather than the audio drama you may already be familiar with. We hope you enjoy the collection, folks. The Picture in the House by H. P. Lovecraft Searches after horror haunt strange, far places. For them are the catacombs of Ptolemais, and the carven mausolea of the nightmare countries. They climb to the moonlit towers of ruined Rhine castles, and falter down black cobwebbed steps beneath the scattered stones of forgotten cities in Asia. The haunted wood and the desolate mountain are their shrines, and they linger around the sinister monoliths on uninhabited islands. But the true epicure in the terrible to whom a new thrill of unutterable ghastliness is the chief end and justification of existence, esteems most of all the ancient, lonely farmhouses of backwoods New England, for there the dark elements of strength, solitude, grotesqueness, and ignorance combine to form the perfection of the hideous. Most horrible of all sights are the little unpainted wooden houses remote from travelled ways, usually squatted upon some damp, grassy slope, or leaning against some gigantic outcropping of rock. Two hundred years and more they have leaned or squatted there, while the vines have crawled and the trees have swelled and spread. They are almost hidden now, in lawless luxuriances of green and guardian shrouds of shadow, but the small-paned windows still stare shockingly as if blinking through a lethal stupor, which wards off madness by dulling the memory of unutterable things. In such houses have dwelt generations of strange people, whose like the world has never seen. Seized with a gloomy and fanatical belief which exiled them from their kind, their ancestors sought the wilderness for freedom. There the scions of a conquering race indeed flourished free from the restrictions of their fellows, but cowered in an appalling slavery to the dismal phantasms of their own minds. Divorced from the enlightenment of civilization, the strength of these Puritans turned into singular channels, and in their isolation, morbid self-repression, and struggle for life with relentless nature, there came to them dark, furtive traits from the prehistoric depths of their cold northern heritage. By necessity practical, and by philosophy stern, these folk were not beautiful in their sins. Erring as all mortals must, they were forced by their rigid code to seek concealment above all else, so that they came to use less and less taste in what they concealed. Only the silent, sleepy, staring houses in the backwoods can tell all that has lain hidden since the early days, and they are not communicative being loath to shake off the drowsiness which helps them forget. Sometimes one feels that it would be merciful to tear down these houses, for they must often dream. It was to a time-battered edifice of this description that I was driven one afternoon in November 1896, by a rain of such chilling copiousness, that any shelter was preferable to exposure. I had been travelling for some time amongst the people of the Miskatonic Valley, in quest of certain genealogical data, and from the remote, devious, and problematical nature of my course, had deemed it convenient to employ a bicycle, despite the lateness of the season. Now I found myself upon an apparently abandoned road, which I had chosen as the shortest cut to Arkham, overtaken by the storm at a point far from any town, and confronted with no refuge save the antique and repellent wooden building, 
which blinked with bleared windows from between two huge leafless elms near the foot of a rocky hill. Distant though it was from the remnant of a road, the house nonetheless impressed me unfavourably the very moment I espied it. Honest, wholesome structures do not stare at travellers so slyly and hauntingly, and in my genealogical researches I had encountered legends of a century before, which biased me against places of this kind. Yet the force of the elements was such as to overcome my scruples, and I did not hesitate to wheel my machine up the weedy rise to the closed door which seemed at once so suggestive and secretive. I had somehow taken it for granted that the house was abandoned, yet as I approached it I was not so sure, for though the walks were indeed overgrown with weeds, they seemed to retain their nature a little too well to argue complete desertion. Therefore, instead of trying the door, I knocked, feeling as I did so a trepidation I could scarcely explain. As I waited on the rough, mossy rock which served as a doorstep, I glanced at the neighbouring windows and the panes of the transom above me, and noticed that, although old, rattling, and almost opaque with dirt, they were not broken. The building, then, must still be inhabited, despite its isolation and general neglect. However, my rapping evoked no response, so after repeating the summons I tried the rusty latch and found the door unfastened. Inside was a little vestibule with walls from which the plaster was falling, and through the doorway came a faint but peculiarly hateful odour. I entered, carrying my bicycle, and closed the door behind me. Ahead rose a narrow staircase, flanked by a small door, probably leading to the cellar while to the left and right were closed doors leading to rooms on the ground floor. Leaning my cycle against the wall, I opened the door at the left, and crossed into a small low-sealed chamber, but dimly lighted by its two dusty windows, and furnished in the barest and most primitive possible way. It appeared to be a kind of sitting-room, for it had a table and several chairs, and an immense fireplace above which ticked an antique clock on a mantel. Books and papers were very few, and in the prevailing gloom I could not readily discern the titles. What interested me was the uniform air of archaism as displayed in every visible detail. Most of the houses in this region I had found rich in relics of the past, but here the antiquity was curiously complete for in all the room I could not discover a single article of definitely post-revolutionary date. Had the furnishings been less humble, the place would have been a collector's paradise. As I surveyed this quaint apartment, I felt an increase in that aversion first excited by the bleak exterior of the house. Just what it was that I feared or loathed, I could by no means define. Something in the whole atmosphere seemed redolent of unhallowed age, of unpleasant crudeness, and of secrets which should be forgotten. I felt disinclined to sit down, and wandered about examining the various articles which I had noticed. The first object of my curiosity was a book of medium size, lying upon the table, and presenting such an antediluvian aspect, that I marvelled at beholding it outside a museum or library. It was bound in leather with metal fittings, and was in an excellent state of preservation, being altogether an unusual sort of volume to encounter in an abode so lowly. When I opened it to the title page, my wonder grew even greater, for it proved to be nothing less rare than Pigafetta's account of the Congo region, written in Latin from the notes of the sailor Lopez, and printed at Frankfurt in 1598. I had often heard of this work, with its curious illustrations by the brothers de Bray, and for a moment forgot my uneasiness in my desire to turn the pages before me. The engravings were indeed interesting, drawn wholly from imagination and careless descriptions, and represented negroes with white skins and Caucasian features. Nor would I soon have closed the book, had not an exceedingly trivial circumstance upset my tired nerves and revived my sensation of disquiet. What annoyed me was merely the persistent way in which the volume tended to fall open of itself at plate twelve, 
which represented in gruesome detail a butcher's shop of the cannibal on Zeke's. I experienced some shame at my susceptibility to so slight a thing, but the drawing nevertheless disturbed me, especially in connection with some adjacent passages descriptive of on Zeke gastronomy. I had turned to a neighbouring shelf, and was examining its meagre literary contents. An eighteenth-century Bible, a pilgrim's progress of like period, illustrated with grotesque woodcuts, and printed by the almanac maker Isaiah Thomas, the rotting bulk of Cotton Mather's Magnalia Christi Americana, and a few other books of evidently equal age, when my attention was aroused by the unmistakable sound of walking in the room overhead. At first astonished and startled, considering the lack of response to my recent knocking at the door, I immediately afterward concluded that the walker had just awakened from a sound sleep, and listened with less surprise, as the footsteps sounded on the creaking stairs. The tread was heavy, yet seemed to contain a curious quality of cautiousness, a quality which I disliked the more because the tread was heavy. When I had entered the room, I had shut the door behind me. Now, after a moment of silence, during which the walker may have been inspecting my bicycle in the hall, I heard a fumbling at the latch, and saw the panelled portal swing open again. In the doorway stood a person of such singular appearance that I should have exclaimed aloud, but for the restraints of good breeding. Old, white-bearded, and ragged, my host possessed a countenance and physique which inspired equal wonder and respect. His height could not have been less than six feet, and despite a general air of age and poverty, he was stout and powerful in proportion. His face, almost hidden by a long beard which grew high on the cheeks, seemed abnormally ruddy and less wrinkled than one might expect, while over a high forehead fell a shock of white hair little thinned by the years. His blue eyes, though a trifle bloodshot, seemed inexplicably keen and burning. But for his horrible unkemptness, the man would have been as distinguished-looking as he was impressive. This unkemptness, however, made him offensive, despite his face and figure. Of what his clothing consisted, I could hardly tell, for it seemed to me no more than a mass of tatters surmounting a pair of high, heavy boots and his lack of cleanliness surpassed description. The appearance of this man, and the instinctive fear he inspired, prepared me for something like enmity, so that I almost shuddered through surprise and a sense of uncanny incongruity, when he motioned me to a chair, and addressed me in a thin, weak voice full of fawning respect and ingratiating hospitality. His speech was very curious an extreme form of Yankee dialect I had thought long extinct, and I studied it closely as he sat down opposite me for conversation. "'Catched in the rain, be you?' he greeted. "'Glad you was nigh the house, and had the sense to come right in. I calculate I was asleep, else I'd have heard you. I ain't as young as I used to be, and I need a powerful side of naps nowadays. Travelling for?' I ain't seen many folks long this rut since they took off the Arkham stage. I replied that I was going to Arkham, and apologized for my rude entry into his domicile, whereupon he continued. Glad to see you, young sir. You faces is scarce round here, and I ain't got much to cheer me up these days. Guess you hail from Basting, don't you? I never been thar, but I can tell a town man when I see him. We had one for district schoolmaster in eighty-four, but he quit sudden, and no one never heard of him since. Here the old man lapsed into a kind of <laughs> chuckle, and made no explanation when I questioned him. He seemed to be in an aboundingly good humour, yet to possess those eccentricities which one might guess from his grooming. For some time he rambled on with an almost feverish geniality— when it struck me to ask him how he came by so rare a book as Pigafetta's Regnum Conga. The effect of this volume had not left me, and I felt a certain hesitancy in speaking of it, but curiosity overmastered all the vague fears which had steadily accumulated since my first glimpse of the house. To my relief, the question did not seem an awkward one, for the old man answered freely and volubly. 
Oh, that Afriki book? Captain Ebenezer Holt traded me that in 68. Hemis was killed in the war. Something about the name of Ebenezer Holt caused me to look up sharply. I had encountered it in my genealogical work, but not in any record since the Revolution. I wondered if my host could help me in the task at which I was labouring, and resolved to ask him about it later on. He continued, Ebenezer was on a Salem merchantman for years, and picked up a side of queer stuff in every port. He got this in London, I guess. He used to like to buy things at the shops. I was up to his house once on the hill, trading horses, when I see this book. I relish the pictures, so we give it in on a swap. Tis a queer book. Here, leave me get on my spectacles. The old man fumbled among his rags, producing a pair of dirty and amazingly antique glasses with small octagonal lenses and steel bows. Donning these, he reached for the volume on the table and turned the pages lovingly. Ebenezer could read a little of this. Tis Latin, but I can't. I had two or three schoolmasters read me a bit, and Passion Clark, him they say got drowned in the pond. Can you make anything out in it? I told him that I could, and translated for his benefit a paragraph near the beginning. If I erred, he was not scholar enough to correct me, for he seemed childishly pleased at my English version. His proximity was becoming rather obnoxious, yet I saw no way to escape without offending him. I was amused at the childish fondness of this ignorant old man for the pictures in a book he could not read, and wondered how much better he could read the few books in English which adorn the room. This revelation of simplicity removed much of the ill-defined apprehension I had felt, and I smiled as my host rambled on. Queer how pictures can set a body thinking. Take this and here, near the front. Have you ever seen trees like that, with big leaves a-flopping over and down? Them men, th them can be niggers. They do beat all. Kind of like Injuns, I guess, even if they be in Africa. Some of these here critters look like monkeys, or half monkeys and half men, but I never heard of nothing like this one. Here he pointed to a fabulous creature of the artist, which one might describe as a sort of dragon with the head of an alligator. But now I'll show you the best one. Over here nigh the middle. The old man's speech grew a trifle thicker, and his eyes assumed a brighter glow. But his fumbling hands, though seemingly clumsier than before, were entirely adequate to their mission. The book fell open, almost of its own accord, and as if from frequent consultation at this place, to the repellent twelfth plate showing a butcher's shop amongst the Anzique cannibals. My sense of restlessness returned, though I did not exhibit it. The especially bizarre thing was that the artist had made his Africans look like white men. The limbs and quarters hanging about the walls of the shop were ghastly, while the butcher with his axe was hideously incongruous. But my host seemed to relish the view as much as I disliked it. What do you think of this? Ain't never seen the like hereabouts, eh? When I see this, I tell Deb Holt, that's something to stir you up and make your blood tickle. When I read in scripture about slaying, like them Midianites was slew, I kind of think things, but I ain't got no picture of it. Here a body can see all there is to it. I suppose to sinful, but ain't we all born and living in sin? That feller being chopped up gives me a tickle every time I look at him. I have to keep looking at him. See where the butcher cut off his feet? There's his head on that bench, with one arm side of it, and t'other arm's on the ground side of the meat block. As the man mumbled on in his shocking ecstasy, the expression on his hairy, spectacled face became indescribable, but his voice sank rather than mounted. My own sensations can scarcely be recorded. All the terror I had dimly felt before rushed upon me actively and vividly, and I knew that I loathed the ancient and abhorrent creature so near me with an infinite intensity. His madness, or at least his partial perversion, seemed beyond dispute. He was almost whispering now, with a huskiness more terrible than a scream, and I trembled as I listened. As I says, tis queer how pictures set you thinking. You know, young sir, I'm right sad on this in here. Arter I got the book off of Herby, used to look at it a lot. 
especially when I'd heard Passion Clark ran a Sundays in his big wig. Once I tried something funny. Here, young sir, don't get scared. All I'd done was to look at the picture afore I killed the sheep for market. Killing sheep was kind of more fun, out of looking at it. The tone of the old man now sank very low, sometimes becoming so faint that his words were hardly audible. I listened to the rain, and to the rattling of the bleared, small-paned windows, and marked a rumbling of approaching thunder, quite unusual for the season. Once a terrific flash and peal shook the frail house to its foundations, but the whisperer seemed not to notice it. Killing sheep was kind of more fun, but, do you know, to want quite satisfying. Queer how a craving gets a hold on you. As you love the almighty young man, don't tell nobody. But I swore to God that picture began to make me hungry for victuals I couldn't raise nor buy. Here, set still, what's ailing you? I didn't do nothing. Only I wondered how it would be if I did. They say meat makes blood and flesh and gives you new life. So I wondered if twouldn't make a man live longer and longer if twas more the same. But the whisper never continued. The interruption was not produced by my fright, nor by the rapidly increasing storm amidst whose fury I was presently to open my eyes on a smoky solitude of blackened ruins. It was produced by a very simple, though somewhat unusual, happening. The open book lay flat between us, with the picture staring repulsively upward. As the old man whispered the words, more the same, a tiny, spattering impact was heard, and something showed on the yellowed paper of the upturned volume. I thought of the rain and of a leaky roof, but rain is not red. On the butcher's shop of the Onzique cannibals, a small red spattering glistened picturesquely, lending vividness to the horror of the engraving. The old man saw it, and stopped whispering even before my expression of horror made it necessary. Saw it, and glanced quickly toward the floor of the room he had left an hour before. I followed his glance, and beheld just above us, on the loose plaster of the ancient ceiling, a large irregular spot of wet crimson, which seemed to spread even as I viewed it. I did not shriek or move, but merely shut my eyes. A moment later came the titanic thunderbolt of thunderbolts, blasting that accursed house of unutterable secrets, and bringing the oblivion which alone saved my mind. The Haunting at Ravenglass A Karnaki the Ghostfinder Story by Ian Gordon In response to Karnaki's card of invitation, I made the pleasant journey to 427 Cheney Walk, and, as usual, was unsurprised to discover that I was the last to arrive. Arkwright, Jessop, and Taylor shook angry fists at me as I joined them at the dinner table. Our host sat in silence, contemplating the tidy plate of food before him. "'By Jove, Karnaki, you, you've barely touched your steak,' I said. "'After listening to my yarn this evening, Dodgson,' Karnaki returned, "'perhaps you'll understand why. It happens I may never look at red meat the same way again.' "'Certainly you're out of sorts, Karnaki,' Taylor put in. "'Yes, Taylor, and with good reason.' "'Well?' This from Jessop. "'Patience, Jessop, I'll get to the thing momentarily. Dodgson, pass my pipe, will you?' Slowly and with great care, Karnaki lit his pipe. "'Now, then, I've just returned from a trip north, Cambria, as I'm sure you're all aware. In total, I spent four nights up there, in response to a letter from Miss Elizabeth Montague, the daughter of Mr. William Montague, the current proprietor of Montague Castle, near Ravenglass. Dodgson, I believe you're familiar with the spot?' Indeed, I was there in ninety-six. Of course. Now listen. Dodson aside, the rest of you chaps may be unaware that the Montagues have been offering lodgings to the weary traveller this past twenty years or so. A guinea affords you a good-sized double room in the castle's east wing, an evening meal, and a hearty breakfast. <laughs> hearty being the operative word, if truth be told. But the fact of the matter is that 
Montague Castle, in all its splendour, has a terrible reputation for being something of a haunted house. I imagine you've heard talk of Tom Fool Dodson? Aye, Thomas Skelton, no less. Rarely seen, but often felt. Mischievous spirit, they say. Exactly right. However, it wasn't with regards to old Tom Fool that the young Miss Montague contacted me. It was on the subject of something much more peculiar, possibly outranking that strange case of the whistling. This peculiarity, on which I'll elaborate if you'll hold your horses, Jessop, aroused my interest, and so I made the journey to Ravenglass by train. Departing the locomotive, I stepped out into the terrible chill of the north, and Presently was much relieved to be met by the Montague's gentleman-in-waiting, Mr. Rees. Into the warmth of a fine jaunting car I was invited, and within a quarter of an hour we were on the outskirts of the castle. But it was already late in the afternoon, and, as you may know, the weather in the lakes can be rather volatile, especially in early spring. Dark clouds surrounded the castle, preventing me from getting a good look at it—a kind of foreshadowing, if you will, for what was to follow— Reese hadn't a word for me the entire journey, which in the end I concluded was fortunate, given the awful mood that had taken hold of me in the presence of that foreboding castle in the valley. Miss Montague met us by the door to the east wing, ushering me inside prior to the imminent downpour those terrible clouds were threatening to unleash. Reese simply vanished. I presumed he'd gone to tend to the horses. In the moments that followed, I learned that I was to be the third of three guests that first night, my counterparts a travelling salesman from Preston, and a young painter from Egremont. The former was Hodgson, the latter Powell—Gina Powell, if memory serves, a talented artist, but I digress. In my eagerness to get to work, as it were, I insisted that Miss Montague lay it all out for me, and without much ado, off we went through a chilly hall and corridor, up an elegant spiral staircase, and across a vast landing— at the end of which was an open dining-room, complete with mahogany dining-table, scores of bookshelves, a dozen family portraits, and several ornate tapestries, of little or no consequence to my tale. The butler, Pace was his name, seated me at the dining-table, and saw that a platter comprising cured meats and cheeses was under my nose before Miss Montague could begin her recitation. Over a glass of port she related, as best she could, the crux of the matter. In essence, the strangeness amounted to this. Over the preceding three weeks, a number of guests housed in the East Wing had reported sightings of an ostensibly supernatural nature. In each of the reports, of which there had been seven, the guest, or guests in question, had described the sudden appearance, or visitation, of a ghostly figure at the southern end of the long corridor connecting the bedrooms on the first floor. This figure, according to the reports, would be seen to traverse the length of the corridor in a northerly direction, stopping before each of the bedrooms along the way. Upon reaching the third door in succession, it would extend a hand, and in the act of operating the door-handle, it would vanish abruptly. I asked Miss Montague if any of the reports had offered a description of this nocturnal visitor. But, regrettably, the guests had been vague in this respect, proffering little more than that the figure had been male, of medium height, and wore a curious look of consternation on its face. Deep in thought, I resolved to consume a selection of meats from the platter before me, excused myself from the table, and followed Mr. Pace to my room at the northern end of the adjoining corridor, the very corridor in which the figure had been repeatedly sighted, and—yes, you guessed it, chaps—to the very door before which the figure had frequently disappeared. Dodson, do you recall the room in which you were a guest all those years ago? Hmm, can't say I do, Carnacki. No matter. As you know, chaps, I tend to travel light, and so, thanking Mr. Pace for showing me to my quarters, I entered the room with my travel case and opened it up on the bed, a nice four-poster, too. Perhaps you remember the bed you slept in, Dodson. Can't say I do. Fine, fine. There's no reaching you, Dodson. Listen, in cases such as this, I tend to arm myself with a healthy scepticism— it does little good to walk into a place with a mind wide open, much better to keep oneself grounded. Do you follow me? Time and time again I've investigated reports of ghouls and spectres, only to discover that the figure at the end of the hall is merely a flickering flame, the grasping hands little more than the dancing shadows of twigs in the moonlight. Remember the farewell Henrietta case? 
But, that said, on occasion, the world of the supernatural makes demands of us, and we, as investigators, must remain sensitive to the subtle changes in light, sound, and energy vibrations that are indicative of such demands. I doubt any of you chaps will ever forget the County Bravadas case. I hear those disembodied voices to this day. Nevertheless, as I was saying, my travel case was open on the bed, and I began the obligatory process of sifting through its contents, namely, a box of chalk for the purpose of marking out protective circles, five empty jars, should the need to create a water circle arise, my dusty and trusty copy of the Sigsund MS, a length of rope, which, as it turns out, was entirely unnecessary in the end, and various miscellaneous items pertaining to the task at hand, a task in which the full extent of its particulars were yet to be revealed to me. I was about to consult the Sigsund with regards to bothersome apparitions, when there came a knock upon my bedroom door. The chap standing there when I answered the summons was none other than my neighbour, Hodson, the travelling salesman from Preston. "'Hello,' he said, as he shook my hand. "'Here about the ghost, are we?' "'Yes,' I returned, though the term ghost may be a little premature at this stage. "'Nothing premature about it,' continued Hodson. "'You'll see for yourself when the clock strikes nine. Exchanging civilities, and unfortunately committing to further idle banter during our evening meal courtesy of the Montagues, I waved Hodgson off and quietly resumed my studies. Dinner was a pleasant affair, in which Miss Montague served as hostess in her father's absence. Mr. Montague was apparently away on business in Edinburgh. Hodgson ate well, but it was his appetite for port that made his presence at the table notable. <laughs> what a mouth that northerner had on him! Powell, my— other neighbour kept to herself, though I have to say she did appear to be mildly interested when I spoke of my plan for the evening. I'll cut right to it here, chaps. My plan wasn't much of a plan at all. As a matter of fact, I merely intended to observe. If there truly was an apparition, a spirit, or whatever you want to call it, roaming the corridors of the castle, I wanted to simply catch sight of it in the first instance. Only a fool, without knowing what he or she is up against, would embark upon anything more ambitious than that. And, as I've already said, it's essential to be a little sceptical at the outset. And so I finished my meal, which concluded with a remarkable apple strudel, I might add, excused myself from the dining-table, and returned to my bedroom to prepare for my vigil. I'd informed Miss Montague, as well as Powell and the now intoxicated Hodgson, to confine themselves to their rooms from 8.45 p.m. I felt it mightily important to set the stage, as it were, to give the uninvited guest free reign. At precisely 8.55 p.m. I emerged from my bedroom, and proceeded to position myself in the quiet and shadowy northwest corner of the corridor, a mere stone's throw from my bedroom door. There was a discernible chill in the air, aided by a steady but gentle draught which tormented the naked candle-flames about me, casting strange shapes which danced across the walls. I felt the conditions were apposite for the nocturnal visitor to make its first appearance. And appear it did. How best to describe it to you? Well, I suppose I'd have to say that I felt the thing before I saw it. With that damnable chill assaulting my senses, I was already unnerved. Perhaps that very dip in body temperature was what attuned me to the thing. But when I first sensed that presence, uh, it was akin to the sudden onset of goose-flesh one ascribes to feet passing over their grave. And then I saw it, or him. For a human outline it was assuredly, though translucent in nature, like so much mist or steam organized into the shape of a human being. Do I make it clear to you? From my vantage point, there in the shadowy recesses of the corridor, it was as though I was invisible to the thing, and I felt with some certainty that it was simply impervious to my presence. And, assured by my supposition, I observed as the figure went about its routine, the very routine described by Miss Montague. The mist-like figure that walked in the manner of a man crept along the corridor, first stopping to look upon Hodgson's door, then continuing in the direction of Powell's door, before once again stopping in its luminous tracks to gaze upon it. I have to admit, chaps, the chill of the corridor did little to prevent the sweat from breaking out on my brow as the shape moved towards the third door, my door, nearing me in the process. 
and I tell you it was as silent as the stars. The vagueness of the descriptions the previous guests had given of the thing were now quite understandable, and I was able to corroborate several details. It appeared to be male, it was of medium height, and yes, I suppose, for what appeared to be little more than a mass of luminous vapour, one could be forgiven for saying that it had a look of consternation on its face. I tell you, chaps, it was quite something. And yet, despite its proximity, I was still convinced the thing wasn't aware of me. It had a single purpose—to gain entrance to my bedroom. I watched closely as its hand passed through the solid door handle. I continued to watch as that extraordinary appendage clutched thin air, and I stood aghast as the thing promptly vanished before my eyes. And when I say vanish, I mean vanish—a swift and sudden departure. Immediately I made for the door, and thrust it open. But there was nothing to behold within simply my bedroom, as I had left it a mere ten minutes earlier. I was baffled. But in that moment it occurred to me that perhaps the figure's destination wasn't quite as important as its origin, and so I armed myself with a piece of chalk, and stepped back into the corridor. Slowly, ever so slowly, I retraced the path of the visitor, from its final position in front of my bedroom door, to the point in which I first observed it, in the southeast corner of the passageway, and there I happened upon another door, somewhat smaller than its neighbours, and as I learned upon attempting to open it, a locked door. I felt rather strongly that something of significance lay on the other side of that door, and thus I resolved to discuss the matter with Miss Montague in the morning. I spent the remainder of that first evening in quiet contemplation by the fireplace in my bedroom. The logs had reduced to smouldering embers by the time I elected to rest, and though my protracted meditations yielded nothing of value, I knew the key to the thing lay on the other side of that locked door. Dodgson, pass my tobacco, will you? The following morning, having slept rather restlessly, I hauled my weary frame to breakfast a little after seven a.m. Miss Montague and Powell were chatting amongst themselves, and I was surprised to see Mr. Rees at the far end of the table, a plate stacked high with bacon, sausages, eggs, and the like under his nose. Noticing my entrance, he eyeballed me curiously, nodded absently, and returned to the task of eating without much ado. By the time Hodgson surfaced, the rest of us had finished eating, and I raised the issue of the locked door with Miss Montague. There was no mystery, she said. It was simply another bedroom, a bedroom yet to be renovated for guests and a single room at that. I asked if she'd unlock it for me, to which she assented, though I have to say there was a subtle reluctance about her manner that struck me oddly. Following one last cup of tea, the two of us excused ourselves from the dining-table, a gesture that Hodgson, in his stupor, failed to notice, and proceeded in the direction of the locked door. Given the amount of effort required for Miss Montague to unlock that door, the large brass lock refusing to yield to her numerous wiggles and jiggles, I concluded that it must have been locked for a considerable amount of time—four years, in fact, was what she told me. Apparently, the room had once belonged to a young boy by the name of David, she said, a cousin who had lived at the castle for a time, following the death of his father. The boy had complained about the room, she added, saying it was always too warm, too stuffy, that he would wake up wet and sweating night after night. Now, chaps, Take note, Arkwright, this will resonate with you. Professor Garder, in his work, Experiments with a Medium, talks in some detail about compressed atmospheric conditions, and the effect of such upon individuals confined to small spaces. And, specifically, he emphasizes the most common cause of such conditions. Do you follow me, Arkwright? Incorporeal visitations, of course. Precisely. Incorporeal visitations— the sudden and inexplicable appearance of apparitions, spirits, spectres, ghouls, call them what you will. And so, in hearing about this boy, this cousin of the Montagues, I felt fairly certain that the figure's point of origin was in fact our present location, the boy's room, or the unrenovated bedroom, as Miss Montague had referred to it. But the boy's story didn't end there. Miss Montague went on to confess that the primary reason for the room's current state of desertion was the boy's sudden disappearance. Yes, chaps, the plot thickens. Allegedly, 
the boy had grown increasingly displeased with his lodgings, often waking in the middle of the night, dripping with sweat, complaining of foul odours, and I must stress this next point, for it is pivotal to understanding the thing, of seeing strange reflections in the large mirror affixed to the south wall. The boy had been unable to describe the reflections, other than noting, on more than one occasion, that the surface of the glass often appeared to be damp with condensation, particularly on the nights he had suffered from the sweats. Oddly, though, he noted that the window on the east wall was always perfectly clear of condensation on these occasions. Though it was unquestionably his own face, he would say, reflected in the mirror, he would also say, and I quote, that the boy on the other side of the glass wasn't quite himself, that the boy saw with eyes of his own, and that he listened with ears of his own. But when he brushed the condensation away, he would conclude, the idea that the boy wasn't himself was brushed away with it. Odd chaps, I know, but there's more. Intrigued by Miss Montague's story of the missing boy, I tentatively approached the mirror on the wall. It was some eight feet in height from floor to ceiling, and some four feet across, quite a size altogether. It lacked a distinctive frame to speak of, and in terms of its position on the wall, it looked as though it had been positioned there to hide something. Another door, perhaps. I inquired as to what lay on the other side of the south wall beyond the room, to which Miss Montague informed me, much to my disappointment, that there was nothing there at all, simply the southern outer wall of the east wing. Regardless, my instincts told me that I was on the right track, and so, dismissing Miss Montague, I once again turned my gaze upon the vast looking-glass. I studied the mirror minutely, tracing its numerous scuffs and scrapes, looking for subtle etchings that might resemble letters, or even words, and though my search yielded nothing by way of a hidden message, it did in fact reveal something much stranger, a series of interconnecting marks that formed a curious shape, a familiar shape. Retrieving several sheets of tracing paper from my travel case, I returned to the mirror, and began, in a terribly rough and by no means accurate fashion, to trace the marks. I continued to trace until I had copied the entirety of the shape onto six sheets of paper, and then, rather crudely, laid them out on the floor beneath me. And there it was, the outline of a human being, the shape of a boy little more than four feet in height, the rough suggestion of arms held aloft in protest. Now, I know this may be difficult to follow, chaps, and almost impossible to believe, but nevertheless, it was my firm belief that the vanished Montague cousin had physically penetrated the surface of the mirror somehow, becoming lost on the other side. Do you see? It all comes down to compressed atmospheric conditions. Just as spirits can enter our plane of existence under such conditions, that young boy, highly sensitive to said conditions, entered theirs. I returned to the dining-room, asked that Pace fix me a piping hot cup of coffee, and asked Miss Montague to invite each and every individual on the castle grounds to attend an audience with me, on the double. Within ten minutes, Pace, who hadn't forgotten my coffee, by the way, Rhys, Hodgson, Powell, and Miss Montague were sitting opposite me at the dining-table. I tell you, chaps, the suspense was palpable. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' I began, "'we have here a most unusual case of haunting, and by that I mean the ghost in this case is not a ghost at all, but a living, breathing human being. But Karnaki, a man made of mist, you can't be serious. Patience, Jessop, allow me to get to the crux of the thing, and pass the decanter while you're at it. Now then, where was I? Ah, yes. I know, I continued, addressing the group at the table, that this may be difficult to believe, but the figure some of us have seen is little more than a visitor from the other side, a visitor from the mirror universe. The mirror what? Hodgson all but yelled. The mirror universe, I repeated. And Hodgson fell silent. The rest of the group remained equally so. I eyeballed Miss Montague. It is true, I said, that your cousin disappeared four years ago, but if you'll permit me to conduct a certain ritual this evening, I'm sure the six of us, together, can bring the boy back. Miss Montague was speechless but the look upon her salient features was one of quiet relief, and, dare I say it, hope. In order to successfully effect his safe return, I added, 
The six of you will need to assist me with the ritual. And I rambled for a while, briefly touching upon the Samar ritual and what would be required of each of them, but I felt it pertinent to leave certain details out for the nonce, so as to ensure at least some degree of level-headedness. And so I spent the rest of the morning and the early afternoon in the unrenovated bedroom, preparing for the ritual. Firstly, with a broom of hyssop, I swept away four years' worth of dust, cobwebs, and general detritus, and measured out a semicircle ten feet in diameter, with a large mirror at its midpoint. This would form the perimeter of my chosen method of protection, the water semicircle. The drawing of the chalk line would have to wait, for there were further intermediary stages to be discussed with my colleagues, namely the nature of their roles as spectators outside of the semicircle, and the guidelines pertaining to their general conduct when in position. Furthermore, though I'd studied the segment on interdimensional gateways in the Sigson manuscript, and was moderately well versed in the seven primary principles, this was to be my first experience with such phenomena, in a practical sense, and so it was absolutely essential that my planning be meticulous in every detail. Thus the hours passed, the six of us traipsing back and forth along the shadowy corridor between the bedroom and the dining room, pace providing a steady stream of provisions rich in minerals at my request. Sodium depletion can be a real nuisance in certain situations. <laughs> right, Taylor? The hour drew near, and at approximately 8.30 p.m., I informed the others that the time had come to draw the semicircle in chalk. I did so immediately, and, of course, was careful to never cross the line. I proceeded to complete the water semicircle as I've described many times before, by smudging garlic beyond the chalked line, and by going over the semicircle a second time with that certain water to make the second sign of the Samar ritual. You chaps know the routine by now. My counterparts were situated on the outside of the semicircle, each standing two feet apart from one another. Their collective presence, I said, positioned thusly, was to compensate for the inevitable shift in atmospheric conditions the imminent ritual would invariably produce. They watched my actions incomprehensibly, despite my numerous attempts to clearly and unambiguously illustrate my intentions. Safe within my protective barrier, I turned to face the mirror, and my gaze was immediately drawn to the faint outline of the boy, his arms aloft in protest. I shuddered, but felt reassured by the water semicircle and my compensatory company and then, reciting the spectacle of Toth, I raised my arms and held them aloft momentarily, mimicking the shape of the boy. The ritual initiated, there was little else to do but wait. The minutes ticked by, and the six of us stood in absolute silence, holding our positions. Hodgson coughed once or twice. The poor chap was still ill at ease following the previous night's debauch. It was precisely 8.57 p.m. when the thing I'd anticipated began to manifest itself. Just as the Montague cousin had once described, I felt myself breaking out into a sweat, whilst in front of me, on the surface of the mirror, small globules of water, condensation, began to appear before my eyes. I quickly turned to face my counterparts, who, unlike myself, appeared to be unaffected by the sudden change in atmospheric conditions. Their collective presence was proving to be very effective indeed. The water semicircle, too, was having the desired effect. The phenomenon was contained within it. As the layer of condensation intensified, I could just about make out the shape of a figure beyond it. Not myself, mind you, but the figure I'd witnessed in the corridor the previous night, that mist-like individual, male of medium height, that look of consternation on his face. Or, perhaps, the thought briefly occurred, it was me, for I was male, of medium height, and presently I sure as the days long had an unhealthy look of consternation upon my face. But when I would have moved, it was the figure in the mirror that moved, closer and closer it encroached, until I was forced to react in kind, and slowly, hesitantly, in an almost unconscious effort to ensure that the thing moving towards me was in fact my own image, I glided towards the glass. Beads of sweat peppered my brow. I had to resist the urge to brush them away, for to do so would have hampered my line of sight. I continued to amble forward in the direction of the mirror, slowly, ever so slowly, until my nose was practically touching the glass. But, 
Presently, the condensation was so thick that I was unable to perceive anything beyond it. My face, his face, nothing at all. Yet halt I did not. I continued forward, ever forward, towards the condensation. And, to my commingled sense of exhilaration and horror, I stepped through the surface of the glass. <gasps> to describe it now, well, I'm at a loss for words, chaps. Imagine being submerged in a body of water for several seconds, only to emerge thereafter entirely bone-dry. I wonder if this poor example means anything to you. When I emerged on the other side of that strange portal, my suspicions were confirmed, for I discovered another world beyond that watery veil. And there, in a room precisely the reflection of the unconverted bedroom, I gazed upon the reflections of my counterparts, each of them situated exactly where I'd instructed them to stand, but in reverse. Do you follow me, chaps? I was in the mirror universe, and I gazed upon living reflections. But somebody was missing. The other Thomas Karnake. Damn it, Jessop! I was just getting to that. Ah, uh, anyway, my reflection had indeed crossed over. And what's more, the figure witnessed and subsequently reported by all those guests, myself included, was the very same Thomas Karnake of the mirror universe. You see, chaps, in that moment of realization, I began to understand. The other, me, had appeared to the guests of the East Wing in an effort to summon me, knowing that the only individual capable of recovering the missing boy was the Thomas Karnake of the boy's native universe. I knew I had little time to take action, and so I took another step forward in that strange reality, frantically seeking the Montague cousin. He was difficult to locate initially, the reason for which will become clear to you momentarily. Between and beyond the reflections of my counterparts, I searched long and hard, but lo and behold, I eventually began to perceive the crude profile of a small figure in the shape of a boy. Like the Mist Man, or the other me in our universe, the Montague cousin in the Mirror universe appeared indeterminate, little more than a murky mass, a caricature of humanity, a moving sketch. I beckoned the boy, and immediately the shape came running towards me. I gripped what I believed to be the boy's arm, turned, and leapt through the cloudy portal. We landed in a heap on the other side, the boy and me, and from the look of shock and exasperation I caught on the face of Miss Montague, <laughs> I understood the boy hadn't aged a day. What had happened to him on the other side would be a story for another time, perhaps, for as he lay there within the safety of the semicircle, I sensed confusion and, understandably, fear. But as I lay there, all but ready to congratulate myself, Hodgson did a terrible thing. To this day, I don't know what it was he thought he saw in that old mirror, but he abandoned both his reason and his post, and rushed headlong, destroying the water semicircle as he went, straight towards the glass. Instantaneously, I crawled on my hands and knees towards the break in the chalked circle, in a desperate effort to restore it. But it was too late. You see, when Hodgson penetrated the semicircle, he triggered a cascade event. The mirror, or doorway, that we'd established had, up until that moment, been held open forcibly by a combination of the unified presence of the five figures beyond the semicircle, and of the invocation of the spectacle of Toth within it. But now, with the water semicircle destroyed, the portal was closing rapidly. Hodgson's last conscious action in this world was to propel his body through the air in the direction of the closing doorway. But he didn't quite make it. Well, some of his torso did. And that, Dodgson, is why my taste for red meat isn't quite what it used to be. And that's it? I asked. That's the top and bottom of it, Dodgson, yes. Questions? Well, what happened next? We cleared away all evidence of the ritual, saw that the boy was fed and watered, and reported Hodgson's accident to the police. And although no evidence of foul play was uncovered, it was quite unsurprising that the man's death was considered more than a little odd, that his legs, trousers and all, were found in the unconverted bedroom, and his torso, well, what remained of it, 
was found on the cold, hard ground at the bottom of the east wing's south wall. In order to allay their concerns of a reprisal, I stayed on in the company of Miss Montague and a justifiably shell-shocked pal for the following couple of nights, insisting that we'd put an end to the haunting at Ravenglass. Leave the rest to Tom Fool, I say. I'm confused, Taylor put in. What exactly was it that allowed the other Karnaki and the boy to travel between universes in the first place? Well, Taylor, it, it was a combination of things. The boy and his sensitiveness to incorporeal visitations was a contributing factor. And don't forget, other spirits walk those corridors. Any one of them could have triggered those unusual conditions I mentioned. The boy merely exploited the phenomenon, albeit unintentionally. Then it was Arkwright's turn to ask a question. And your reflected counterparts in the mirror universe, could they see you when you cross the threshold? And if so, why couldn't the other Karnaki see you in the corridor? It all boils down to one's sensitiveness, Arkwright. Some see, others don't. And who can say for sure what it is one has and hasn't seen? As for the other Karnaki, perhaps he was aware of me, and his appearances, as I've stated, were intended to lure me into his universe. And there's the question of time, too, isn't there? This from Jessop. You say the boy hadn't aged a day, yet when you encountered him in the mirror universe, he wasn't frozen in time, as it were, was he? No, Jessop, but you're correct when you say there's a question of time. The boy may not have aged physically, but I'm absolutely certain that that troubled youngster will carry the burden of his experience mentally for the rest of his days. As I said, his story is for another time, perhaps. One more question, I asked. If the other Karnaki had truly been attempting to reach you all this time, then why do you think it took him so long to successfully do so? A difficult question, Dodson. Perhaps the most difficult of all. We spoke of time, and of its effect on the boy in the mirror universe. How is it that he was unable to simply step back through the portal? And, conversely, how is it that he was able to make contact with the other Thomas Karnacki, to persuade the other me to help him find a way home? Perhaps he didn't make contact with him at all. Perhaps there was no other me. Perhaps the figure I saw in the corridor was simply a reflection of my will, a will born out of my insatiable need to understand the misunderstood, that unyielding desire to seek out and liberate the haunted and the desperate, and, later, a will encouraged by my realization that the Montague cousin, thanks to his tremendous sensitivity to certain conditions, had unwittingly stumbled into another world, a world I'm still at a loss to explain. As for what those other guests and witnesses saw, again, I name Tom Fool as a likely candidate. Do I make it clear to you? On this occasion, I said, No, Karnaki, you do not. Marvellous. Karnaki stood up and motioned towards the door. Out you go. And presently we went, somewhat dumbfounded, into the quiet of the embankment, and so to our various homes. The White Villa by Ralph Adams Cram When we left Naples on the 810 train for Pestum, Tom and I, we fully intended returning by the 246. Not because two hours' time seemed enough wherein to exhaust the interests of those deathless ruins of a dead civilization, but simply for the reason that, as our indicatory informed us, there was but one other train, and that at 611, which would land us in Naples too late for the dinner at the Turner's and the San Carlo afterwards. Not that I cared in the least for the dinner or the theatre, but then I was not so obviously in Miss Turner's good graces as Tom Rendell was, which made a difference. However, we had promised, so that was an end of it. This was in the spring of eighty-eight, and at that time the railroad, which was being pushed onward to Reggio, whereby travellers to Sicily might be spared the agonies of a night on the fickle Mediterranean, reached no farther than Agropoli, some twenty miles beyond Pestum. But although the trains were as yet few and slow, we accepted the half-finished road with gratitude, for it penetrated the very centre of Campanian brigandage, and made it possible for us to see the matchless temples in safety, while a few years before it was necessary for intending visitors to obtain a military escort from the government, and military escorts are not for young architects. 
So we set off contentedly that white May morning, determined to make the best of our few hours, little thinking that before we saw Naples again we were to witness things that perhaps no American had ever seen before. For a moment, when we left the train at Pesto, and started to walk up the flowery lane leading to the temples, we were almost inclined to curse this same railroad. We had thought, in our innocence, that we should be alone, that no one else would think of enduring the long four hours' ride from Naples just to spend two hours in the ruins of these temples, but the event proved our unwisdom. We were not alone. It was a compact little party of conventional sightseers that accompanied us, the inevitable English family with the three daughters, prominent of teeth, flowing of hair, aggressive of scarlet Murrays and Baedekers, the two blonde and untidy Germans, the French couple from the pages of La Vie Parisienne, and our old man of the sea, the white-bearded Presbyterian minister from Pennsylvania, who had made our life miserable in Rome at the time of the Pope's jubilee. Fortunately for us, this terrible old man had fastened himself upon a party of American schoolteachers travelling on Cook, and for the time we were safe, but our vision of two hours of dreamy solitude faded lamentably away. Yet how beautiful it was, this golden meadow walled with far violet mountains, breathless under a May sun, and in the midst rising from tangles of asphodel and acanthus, vast in the vacant plain, three temples— one silver-grey, one golden-grey, and one flushed with intangible rose. And all around nothing but velvet meadows stretching from the dim mountains behind, away to the sea, that showed only as a thin line of silver just over the edge of the still grass. The tide of tourists swept noisily through the basilica and the temple of Poseidon, across the meadow to the distant temple of Ceres, and Tom and I were left alone to drink in all the fine wine of dreams that was possible in the time left us. We gave but little space to examining the temples the tourists had left, but in a few moments found ourselves lying in the grass to the east of Poseidon, looking dimly out towards the sea, heard now but not seen, a vague and pulsating murmur that blended with the humming of bees all about us. A small shepherd boy, with a woolly dog, made shy advances of friendship, and in a little time we had set him to gathering flowers for us. Asphodels and bee orchids, anemones, and the little thin green iris so fairy-like and frail. The murmur of the tourist crowd had merged itself in the moan of the sea, and it was very still. Suddenly I heard the words I had been waiting for, the suggestion I had refrained from making myself, for I knew Thomas. I say, old man, shall we let the 246 go to thunder? I chuckled to myself. But the Turners! They be blowed. We can tell them we miss the train. That is just exactly what we shall do, I said, pulling out my watch, unless we start for the station right now. But Tom drew an acanthus leaf across his face, and showed no signs of moving. So I filled my pipe again, and we missed the train. As the sun dropped lower towards the sea, changing its silver line to gold, we pulled ourselves together, and for an hour or more sketched vigorously. But the mood was not on us. It was too jolly fine to waste time working, as Tom said, so we started off to explore the single street of the squalid town of Pesto, that was lost within the walls of dead Posidonia. It was not a pretty village, if you can call a rat-riven lane and a dozen houses a village, nor were the inhabitants thereof reassuring in appearance. There was no sign of a church, nothing but dirty huts, and in the midst, one of two stories, rejoicing in the name of Albergo de Sol, the first story of which was a black and cavernous smithy, where certain swarthy knaves, looking like banditti out of a job, sat smoking sulkily. "'We might stay here all night,' said Tom, grinning askance at this choice company." but his suggestion was not received with enthusiasm. Down where the lane from the station joined the main road stood the only sign of modern civilization, a great square structure, half villa, half fortress, with round turrets on its four corners, and a ten-foot wall surrounding it. There were no windows in its first story, so far as we could see, and it had evidently been at one time the fortified villa of some Campanian noble. Now, however, whether because brigandage had been stamped out, or because the villa was empty and deserted, it was no longer formidable, 
The gates of the great wall hung sagging on their hinges, brambles growing all over them, and many of the windows in the upper story were broken and black. It was a strange place, weird and mysterious, and we looked at it curiously. There is a story about that place, said Tom, with conviction. It was growing late. The sun was near the edge of the sea as we walked down the ivy-grown walls of the vanished city for the last time, and as we turned back, a red flush poured from the west, and painted the Doric temples in pallid rose against the evanescent purple of the Apennines. Already a thin mist was rising from the meadows, and the temples hung pink in the misty greyness. It was a sorrow to leave the beautiful things, but we could run no risk of missing this last train, so we walked slowly back towards the temples. "'What is that Johnny waving his arm at us for?' asked Tom suddenly. "'How should I know? We are not on his land, and the walls don't matter.' We pulled out our watches simultaneously. "'What time are you?' I said. Six minutes before six, and I am seven minutes. It can't take us all that time to walk to the station. Are you sure the train goes at six eleven? Dead sure, I answered, and showed him the indicatory. By this time a woman and two children were shrieking at us hysterically, but what they said I had no idea, their Italian being of a strange and awful nature. Look here, I said. Let's run. Perhaps our watches are both slow. Or— Perhaps the timetable has changed. Then we ran, and the populace cheered and shouted with enthusiasm. Our dignified run became a panic-stricken rout, for as we turned into the lane, smoke was rising from beyond the bank that hid the railroad. A bell rang. We were so near that we could hear the interrogative Pronti, the impatient Partenza, and the definitive Andy Armour. For the train was five hundred yards away, steaming towards Naples, when we plunged into the station as the clock struck six, and yelled for the station-master. He came, and we indulged in crimination and recrimination. When we could regard the situation calmly, it became apparent that the timetable had been changed two days before, the six-eleven now leaving at five-fifty-eight. A facchino came in, and we four sat down and regarded the situation judicially. Was there no other train? No. Could we stay at the Albergo de Sol? A forefinger drawn across the throat by the Capo Stazioni with a significant cluck closed that question. Then we must stay with you here at the station. But, Signore, I am not married. I live here only with the Facchini. I have only one room to sleep in. It is impossible. But we must sleep somewhere, likewise eat. What can we do? and we shifted the responsibility deftly on the shoulders of the poor old man, who was growing excited again. He trotted nervously up and down the station for a minute, then he called the Facchino. Giuseppe, go up to the villa and ask if two forestieri who have missed the last train can stay there all night. Protests were useless. The Facchino was gone, and we waited anxiously for his return. It seemed as though he would never come. Darkness had fallen— and the moon was rising over the mountains. At last, he appeared. The signori may stay all night and welcome, but they cannot come to dinner, for there is nothing in the house to eat. This was not reassuring, and again the old station-master lost himself in meditation. The results were admirable, for in a little time the table in the waiting-room had been transformed into a dining-table, and Tom and I were ravenously devouring a big omelette, and bread and cheese, and drinking a most shocking sour wine, as though it were Chateau Ikem. A facchino served us with clumsy good will, and when we had induced our nervous old host to sit down with us and partake of his own hospitality, we succeeded in forming a passably jolly dinner party, forgetting over our sour wine and cigarettes the coming hours from ten until sunrise, which lay before us in a dubious mist. It was with crowding apprehensions, which we strove in vain to joke away, that we set out at last to retrace our steps to the mysterious villa, the Facchino Giuseppe leading the way. By this time the moon was well overhead, and just behind us, as we tramped up the dewy lane, white in the moonlight, between the ink-black hedgerows on either side. How still it was! Not a breath of air, not a sound of life— only the awful silence that had lain almost unbroken for two thousand years, 
over this vast graveyard of a dead world. As we passed between the shattered gates and wound our way in the moonlight through the maze of gnarled fruit trees, decaying farm implements and piles of lumber, towards the small door that formed the only opening in the first story of this deserted fortress, the cold silence was shattered by the harsh baying of dogs somewhere in the distance to the right, beyond the barns that formed one side of the court. From the villa came neither light nor sound. Giuseppe knocked at the weather-worn door, and the sound echoed cavernously within, but there was no other reply. He knocked again and again, and at length we heard the rasping jar of sliding bolts, and the door opened a little, showing an old, old man, bent with age and gaunt with malaria. Over his head he held a big Roman lamp, with three wicks that cast strange shadows on his face, a face that was harmless in its senility, but intolerably sad. He made no reply to our timid salutations, but motioned tremblingly to us to enter, and with a last good night to Giuseppe we obeyed, and stood halfway up the stone stairs that led directly from the door, while the old man tediously shot every bolt and adjusted the heavy bar. Then we followed him in the semi-darkness up the steps, into what had been the great hall of the villa. A fire was burning in a great fireplace so beautiful in design, that Tom and I looked at each other with interest. By its fitful light we could see that we were in a huge circular room covered by a flat, saucer-shaped dome, a room that must once have been superb and splendid, but that now was a lamentable wreck. The frescoes on the dome were stained and mildewed, and here and there the plaster was gone altogether. The carved doorways that led out on all sides had lost half the gold with which they had once been covered, and the floor was of brick, sunken into treacherous valleys. Rough chests, piles of old newspapers, fragments of harnesses, farm implements, a heap of rusty carbines and cutlasses, nameless litter of every possible kind, made the room into a wilderness which under the firelight seemed even more picturesque than it really was. And on this inexpressible confusion of lumber, the pale shapes of the seventeenth-century nymphs, startling in their weather-stained nudity, looked down with vacant smiles. For a few moments we warmed ourselves before the fire, and then, in the same dejected silence, the old man led the way to one of the many doors, handed us a brass lamp, and with a stiff bow turned his back on us. Once in our room alone, Tom and I looked at each other with faces that expressed the most complex emotions. "'Well, of all the rum goes,' said Tom, "'this is the rummiest go I ever experienced.' Right, my boy, as you very justly remark, we are in for it. Help me shut this door, and then we will reconnoitre, take account of stock, and size up our chances. But the door showed no sign of closing. It grated on the brick floor and stuck in the warped casing, and it took our united efforts to jam the two inches of oak into its place, and turn the enormous old key in its rusty lock. Better now, much better now, said Tom. Now let us see where we are. The room was easily twenty-five feet square, and high in proportion. Evidently, it had been a state apartment, for the walls were covered with carved panelling that had once been white and gold, with mirrors in the panels, the wood now stained every imaginable colour, the mirrors cracked and broken, and dull with mildew. The big fire had just been lighted in the fireplace, the shutters were closed, and although the only furniture consisted of two massive bedsteads, and a chair with one leg shorter than the others, the room seemed almost comfortable. I opened one of the shutters that closed the great windows that ran from the floor almost to the ceiling, and nearly fell through the cracked glass into the floorless balcony. "'Tom, come here, quick!' I cried, and for a few minutes neither of us thought about our dubious surroundings, for we were looking at Pestum by moonlight. A flat, white mist like water lay over the entire meadow. From the midst rose against the blue-black sky the three ghostly temples, black and silver in the vivid moonlight, floating, it seemed, in the fog. And behind them, seen in broken glints between the pallid shafts, stretched the line of the silver sea. Perfect silence, the silence of implacable death. 
We watched the white tide of mist rise around the temples, until we were chilled through, and so presently went to bed. There was but one door in the room, and that was securely locked. The great windows were twenty feet from the ground, so we felt reasonably safe from all possible attack. In a few minutes Tom was asleep and breathing audibly, but my constitution is more nervous than his, and I lay awake for some little time, thinking of our curious adventure and of its possible outcome. Finally I fell asleep, for how long I do not know, but I woke with a feeling that someone had tried the handle of the door. The fire had fallen into a heap of coals, which cast a red glow in the room, whereby I could see dimly the outline of Tom's bed, the broken-legged chair in front of the fireplace, and the door in its deep casing by the chimney, directly in front of my bed. I sat up, nervous from my sudden awakening under these strange circumstances, and stared at the door. The latch rattled, and the door swung smoothly open. I began to shiver coldly. That door was locked. Tom and I had all we could do to jam it together and lock it. But we did lock it, and now it was opening silently. In a minute more it has silently closed. Then I heard a footstep. I swear I heard a footstep in the room, and with it the frou-frou of trailing skirts. My breath stopped, and my teeth grated against each other, as I heard the soft footfalls and the feminine rustle pass along the room towards the fireplace. My eyes saw nothing, yet there was enough light in the room for me to distinguish the pattern on the carved panels of the door. The step stopped by the fire, and I saw the broken-legged chair lean to the left, with a little jar as its short leg touched the floor. I sat still, frozen, motionless, staring at the vacancy that was filled with such terror for me, and as I looked, the seat of the chair creaked, and it came back to its upright position again. And then the footsteps came down the room lightly, towards the window. There was a pause, and then the great shutter swung back, and the white moonlight poured in. Its brilliancy was unbroken by any shadow, by any sign of material substance. I tried to cry out, to make some sound, to awaken Tom. This sense of utter loneliness in the presence of the inexplicable was maddening. I don't know whether my lips obeyed my will or no. At all events Tom lay motionless, with his deaf ear up, and gave no sign. The shutters closed as silently as they had opened. The moonlight was gone, the firelight also, and in utter darkness I waited. If only I could see! If something were visible, I should not mind it so much. But this ghastly hearing of every little sound, every rustle of a gown, every breath, yet seeing nothing, was soul-destroying. I think in my abject terror I prayed that I might see, only see, but the darkness was unbroken. Then the footsteps began to waver fitfully, and I heard the rustle of garments sliding to the floor, the clatter of little shoes flung down, the rattle of buttons, and of metal against wood. Rigors shot over me, and my whole body shivered with collapse as I sank back on the pillow, waiting with every nerve tense, listening with all my life. The coverlid was turned back beside me, and in another moment the great bed sank a little as something slipped between the sheets with an audible sigh. I called to my aid every atom of remaining strength, and with a cry that shivered between my clattering teeth, I hurled myself headlong from the bed onto the floor. I must have lain for some time stunned and unconscious, for when I finally came to myself it was cold in the room. There was no last glow of lingering coals in the fireplace, and I was stiff with chill. It all flashed over me like the haunting of a heavy dream. I laughed a little at the dim memory, with the thought, I must try to recollect all the details. They will do to tell Tom, and rose stiffly, to return to bed, when there it was again, and my heart stopped, the hand on the door. I paused and listened. The door opened with a muffled creak, closed again, and I heard the lock turn rustily. I would have died now before getting into that bed again, but there was terror equally without, so I stood trembling and listened, 
listened to heavy, stealthy steps creeping along on the other side of the bed. I clutched the coverlid, staring across into the dark. There was a rush in the air by my face, the sound of a blow, and simultaneously a shriek so awful, so despairing, so blood-curdling, that I felt my senses leaving me again as I sank crouching on the floor by the bed. And then began the awful duel, the duel of invisible, audible shapes, of things that shrieked and raved, mingling thin, feminine cries with low, stifled curses and indistinguishable words. Round and round the room, footsteps chasing footsteps in the ghastly night, now away by Tom's bed, now rushing swiftly down the great room, until I felt the flash of swirling drapery on my hard lips. Round and round, turning and twisting till my brain whirled with the mad cries. They were coming nearer. I felt the jar of their feet on the floor beside me. Came one long, gurgling moan close over my head, and then, crushing down upon me, the weight of a collapsing body. There was long hair over my face, and in my staring eyes. And as awful silence succeeded the less awful tumult, life went out, and I fell unfathomable miles into nothingness. The grey dawn was sifting through the chinks in the shutters when I opened my eyes again. I lay stunned and faint, staring up at the mouldy frescoes on the ceiling, struggling to gather together my wandering senses and knit them into something like consciousness. But now, as I pulled myself little by little together, there was no thought of dreams before me. One after another, the awful incidents of that unspeakable night came back, and I lay incapable of movement, of action, trying to piece together the whirling fragments of memory that circled dizzily around me. Little by little, it grew lighter in the room. I could see the pallid line struggling through the shutters behind me grow stronger along the broken and dusty floor. The tarnished mirrors reflected dirtily the growing daylight. A door closed far away, and I heard the crowing of a cock, then, by and by, the whistling of a passing train. Years seemed to have passed since I first came into this terrible room. I had lost the use of my tongue. My voice refused to obey my panic-stricken desire to cry out. Once or twice I tried in vain to force an articulate sound through my rigid lips, and when at last a broken whisper rewarded my feverish struggles, I felt a strange sense of great victory. How soundly he slept! Ordinarily, rousing him was no easy task, and now he revolted steadily against being awakened at this untimely hour. It seemed to me that I had called him for ages almost, before I heard him grunt sleepily and turn in bed. Tom, I cried weakly, Tom, come and help me. What do you want? What is the matter with you? Don't ask. Come and help me. Fallen out of bed, I guess. And he laughed drowsily. My abject terror lest he should go to sleep again gave me new strength. Was it the actual physical paralysis born of killing fear that held me down? I could not have raised my head from the floor on my life. I could only cry out in deadly fear for Tom to come and help me. "'Why don't you get up and get into bed?' he answered when I implored him to come to me. "'You have got a bad nightmare. Wake up!' But something in my voice roused him at last, and he came chuckling across the room, stopping to throw open two of the great shutters and let a burst of white light into the room. He climbed up on the bed and peered over jeeringly. With the first glance the laugh died, and he leaped the bed and bent over me. "'My God, man, what is the matter with you? You are hurt?' "'I don't know what is the matter. Lift me up, get me away from here, and I'll tell you all I know. But, old chap, you must be hurt awfully. The, the floor is covered with blood.' He lifted my head and held me in his powerful arms. I looked down— a great red stain blotted the floor beside me. But, apart from the black bruise on my head, there was no sign of a wound on my body, nor stain of blood on my lips. In as few words as possible I told him the whole story. "'Let's get out of this,' he said when I had finished. "'This is no place for us. Brigands I can stand, but—' He helped me to dress, and as soon as possible we forced open the heavy door— 
the door I had seen turn so softly on its hinges only a few hours before, and came out into the great circular hall, no less strange and mysterious now in the half-light of dawn than it had been by firelight. The room was empty, for it must have been very early, although a fire already blazed in the fireplace. We sat by the fire some time, seeing no one. Presently, slow footsteps sounded in the stairway, and the old man entered, silent as the night before, nodding to us civilly, but showing by no sign any surprise which he may have felt at our early rising. In absolute silence he moved around, preparing coffee for us, and when at last the frugal breakfast was ready, and we sat around the rough table munching coarse bread and sipping the black coffee, he would reply to our overtures only by monosyllables. Any attempt at drawing from him some facts as to the history of the villa was received with a grave and frigid repellence that baffled us, and we were forced to say adieu with our hunger for some explanation of the events of the night, still unsatisfied. But we saw the temples by sunrise, when the mist-like lambent opals bathed the bases of the tall column salmon in the morning light. It was a rhapsody in the pale and unearthly colours of Pivy de Chavon, vitalised and made glorious with splendid sunlight, the apotheosis of mist, a vision never before seen, never to be forgotten. It was so beautiful that the memory of my ghastly night paled and faded, and it was Tom who assailed the station-master with questions, while we waited for the train from Agropoli. Luckily he was more than loquacious. He was voluble under the ameliorating influence of the money we forced upon him. And this, in few words, was the story he told us while we sat on the platform smoking, marvelling at the mist that rose to the east, now veiling, now revealing, the lavender apennines. Is there a story of La Villa Bianca? Ah, signore, certainly. And a story very strange and very terrible. It was much time ago, a hundred— Two hundred years, I do not know. Well, the Duca di San Damiano married a lady so fair, so most beautiful, that she was called La Luna di Pesto. But she was of the people. More, she was of the banditti. Her father was of Calabria, and a terror of the Campagna. But the Duke was young, and he married her, and for her built the white villa, and it was a wonder throughout Campania. You have seen? It is splendid now— even if a ruin. Well, it was less than a year after they came to the villa before the duke grew jealous, jealous of the new captain of the banditti who took the place of the father of La Luna, himself killed in a great battle up there in the mountains. Was there cause? Who shall know? For there were stories among the people of terrible things in the villa, and how La Luna was seen almost never outside the wars. Then the duke would go for many days to Napoli— coming home only now and then to the villa that was become a fortress, so many men guarded its never-opening gates. And once, it was in the spring, the duke came silently down from Napoli, and there, by the three poplars you see away towards the north, his carriage was set upon by armed men, and he was almost killed, but he had with him many guards, and after a terrible fight the brigands were beaten off, but before him, wounded, lay the captain— the man whom he feared and hated. He looked at him lying there under the torchlight, and in his hand saw his own sword. Then he became a devil. With the same sword he ran the brigand through, leaped in the carriage, and, entering the villa, crept to the chamber of La Luna, and killed her with the sword she had given to her lover. That is all the story of the white villa, except that the duke came never again to Pesto. He went back to the king at Napoli, and for many years he was the scourge of the banditti of Campania, for the king made him a general, and San Damiano was a name feared by the lawless and loved by the peaceful, until he was killed in a battle, down by Moor Manor. And La Luna? Some say she comes back to the villa, once a year, when the moon is full, in the month when she was slain, for the duke buried her, they say, with his own hands, in the garden that was once under the window of her chamber— and as she died unshriven, so she was buried without the pale of the church. Therefore she cannot sleep in peace. Nonno vero? I do not know if the story is true. But this is the story, signore, and there is the train for Napoli. 
Ah, grazie. Signori, grazie tanto. Arrivederci. Signori, arrivederci. The Room in the Tower by E. F. Benson It is probable that everybody who is at all a constant dreamer has had at least one experience of an event or a sequence of circumstances which has come to his mind in sleep being subsequently realized in the material world. But, in my opinion, so far from this being a strange thing, it would be far odder if this fulfilment did not occasionally happen, since our dreams are, as a rule, concerned with people whom we know, and places with which we are familiar, such as might very naturally occur in the awake and daylit world. True, these dreams are often broken into by some absurd and fantastic incident, which puts them out of court in regard to their subsequent fulfilment, but on the mere calculation of chances it does not appear in the least unlikely that a dream imagined by any one who dreams constantly should occasionally come true. Not long ago, for instance, I experienced such a fulfilment of a dream which seems to me in no way remarkable, and to have no kind of psychical significance. The manner of it was as follows. A certain friend of mine, living abroad, is amiable enough to write to me about once in a fortnight. Thus, when fourteen days or thereabouts have elapsed since I last heard from him, my mind, probably either consciously or subconsciously, is expectant of a letter from him. One night, last week, I dreamed that as I was going upstairs to dress for dinner, I heard, as I often heard, the sound of the postman's knock on my front door, and diverted my direction downstairs instead. There, among other correspondence, was a letter from him. Thereafter the fantastic entered, for on opening it I found inside the ace of diamonds, and scribbled across it in his well-known handwriting, I am sending you this for safe custody. As you know, it is running an unreasonable risk to keep aces in Italy. The next evening I was just preparing to go upstairs to dress, when I heard the postman's knock, and did precisely as I had done in my dream. There, among other letters, was one from my friend. Only, it did not contain the ace of diamonds. Had it done so, I should have attached more weight to the matter, which, as it stands, seems to me a perfectly ordinary coincidence. No doubt I consciously or subconsciously expected a letter from him, and this suggested to me my dream. Similarly, the fact that my friend had not written to me for a fortnight suggested to him that he should do so. But occasionally it is not so easy to find such an explanation. And for the following story I can find no explanation at all. It came out of the dark, and into the dark it has gone again. All my life I have been an habitual dreamer. The nights are few, that is to say, when I do not find on awaking in the morning that some mental experience has been mine, and sometimes all night long, apparently, a series of the most dazzling adventures befall me. Almost without exception these adventures are pleasant, although often merely trivial. It is of an exception that I am going to speak. It was when I was about sixteen that a certain dream first came to me, and this is how it befell. It opened with my being sat down at the door of a big red-brick house, where, I understood, I was going to stay. The servant who opened the door told me that tea was being served in the garden, and led me through a low, dark-panelled hall, with a large open fireplace, onto a cheerful green lawn set round with flower-beds. There were grouped about the tea-table a small party of people, but they were all strangers to me except one, who was a schoolfellow called Jack Stone clearly the son of the house, and he introduced me to his mother and father and a couple of sisters. I was, I remember, somewhat astonished to find myself here, for the boy in question was scarcely known to me, and I rather disliked what I knew of him. Moreover, he had left school nearly a year before. The afternoon was very hot, and an intolerable oppression reigned. On the far side of the lawn ran a red brick wall, with an iron gate in its centre, outside which stood a walnut-tree. We sat in the shadow of the house, opposite a row of long windows, inside which I could see a table with cloth laid, glimmering with glass and silver. This garden front of the house was very long, and at one end of it stood a tower of three stories, which looked to me much older than the rest of the building. 
Before long, Mrs. Stone, who, like the rest of the party, had sat in absolute silence, said to me, "'Jack will show you your room. I have given you the room in the tower.' Quite inexplicably my heart sank at her words. I felt as if I had known that I should have the room in the tower, and that it contained something dreadful and significant. Jack instantly got up, and I understood that I had to follow him. In silence we passed through the hall, mounted a great oak staircase with many corners, and arrived at a small landing with two doors set in it. He pushed one of these open for me to enter, and without coming in himself, closed it after me. Then I knew that my conjecture had been right. There was something awful in the room, and with the terror of nightmare growing swiftly and enveloping me, I awoke in a spasm of terror. Now that dream, or variations on it, occurred to me intermittently for fifteen years. Most often it came in exactly this form, the arrival, the tea laid out on the lawn, the deadly silence succeeded by that one deadly sentence, the mounting with Jack Stone up to the room in the tower where horror dwelt, and it always came to a close in the nightmare of terror at that which was in the room, though I never saw what it was. At other times I experienced variations on this same theme. Occasionally, for instance, we would be sitting at dinner in the dining-room, into the windows of which I had looked on the first night when the dream of this house visited me, but wherever we were there was the same silence, the same sense of dreadful oppression and foreboding, and the silence I knew would always be broken by Mrs. Stone saying to me, "'Jack will show you your room. I have given you the room in the tower.' upon which, this was invariable, I had to follow him up the oak staircase with many corners, and enter the place that I dreaded more and more each time that I visited it in sleep. Or, again, I would find myself playing cards, still in silence, in a drawing-room lit with immense chandeliers that gave a blinding illumination. What the game was, I have no idea. What I remember, with a sense of miserable anticipation— was that soon Mrs. Stone would get up and say to me, "'Jack will show you your room. I have given you the room in the tower.' This drawing-room where we played cards was next to the dining-room, and, as I have said, was always brilliantly illuminated, whereas the rest of the house was full of dusk and shadows. And yet, how often, in spite of those bouquets of lights, have I not poured over the cards that would help me, scarcely able, for some reason, to see them?' Their designs, too, were strange. There were no red suits, but all were black, and among them there were certain cards which were black all over. I hated and dreaded those. As this dream continued to recur, I got to know the greater part of the house. There was a smoking-room beyond the drawing-room, at the end of a passage with a green baize door. It was always very dark there, and as often as I went there I passed somebody whom I could not see in the doorway coming out. Curious developments, too, took place in the characters that peopled the dream as might happen to living persons. Mrs. Stone, for instance, who, when I first saw her, had been black-haired, became grey, and instead of rising briskly, as she had done at first, when she said, "'Jack will show you your room, I have given you the room in the tower,' got up very feebly, as if the strength was leaving her limbs. Jack also grew up, and became a rather ill-looking young man, with a brown moustache, while one of the sisters ceased to appear, and I understood she was married. Then it so happened that I was not visited by this dream for six months or more, and I began to hope, in such inexplicable dread did I hold it, that it had passed away for good. But one night after this interval I again found myself being shown out onto the lawn for tea— and Mrs. Stone was not there, while the others were all dressed in black. At once I guessed the reason, and my heart leaped at the thought that perhaps this time I should not have to sleep in the room in the tower, and though we usually all sat in silence, on this occasion the sense of relief made me talk and laugh as I had never yet done. But even then matters were not altogether comfortable, for no one else spoke, for they all looked secretly at each other and soon the foolish stream of my talk ran dry, and gradually an apprehension, worse than anything I had previously known, gained on me as the light slowly faded. 
Suddenly a voice which I knew well broke the stillness, the voice of Mrs. Stone, saying, "'Jack will show you your room. I have given you the room in the tower.' It seemed to come from near the gate in the red brick wall that bounded the lawn, and looking up, I saw that the grass outside was sown thick with gravestones. A curious greyish light shone from them, and I could read the lettering on the grave nearest me, and it was— an evil memory of Julia Stone. And as usual Jack got up, and again I followed him through the hall and up the staircase with many corners. On this occasion it was darker than usual, and when I passed into the room in the tower I could only just see the furniture, the position of which was already familiar to me. Also, there was a dreadful odour of decay in the room, and I woke screaming. The dream, with such variations and developments as I have mentioned went on at intervals for fifteen years. Sometimes I would dream it two or three nights in succession. Once, as I have said, there was an intermission of six months, but taking a reasonable average, I should say that I dreamed it quite as often as once in a month. It had, as is plain, something of nightmare about it, since it always ended in the same appalling terror— which so far from getting less seemed to me to gather fresh fear every time that I experienced it. There was, too, a strange and dreadful consistency about it. The characters in it, as I have mentioned, got regularly older, death and marriage visited this silent family, and I never in the dream, after Mrs. Stone had died, set eyes on her again. But it was always her voice that told me that the room in the tower was prepared for me, and whether we had tea out on the lawn, or the scene was laid in one of the rooms overlooking it, I could always see her gravestone standing just outside the iron gate. It was the same, too, with the married daughter. Usually she was not present, but once or twice she returned again, in company with a man whom I took to be her husband. He, too, like the rest of them, was always silent. But, owing to the constant repetition of the dream, I had ceased to attach, in my waking hours, any significance to it. I never met Jack Stone again during all those years, nor did I ever see a house that resembled this dark house of my dream. And then, something happened. I had been in London in this year, up until the end of July, and during the first week in August, went down to stay with a friend in a house he had taken for the summer months, in the Ashdown Forest district of Sussex. I left London early— for John Clinton was to meet me at Forest Row Station, and we were going to spend the day golfing and go to his house in the evening. He had his motor with him, and we set off about five of the afternoon after a thoroughly delightful day, for the drive, the distance being some ten miles. As it was still so early, we did not have tea at the clubhouse, but waited till we should get home. As we drove, the weather, which up till then had been, though hot, deliciously fresh, seemed to me to alter in quality, and become a very stagnant and oppressive, and I felt that indefinable sense of ominous apprehension that I am accustomed to before thunder. John, however, did not share my views, attributing my loss of lightness to the fact that I had lost both my matches. Events proved, however, that I was right, though I do not think that the thunderstorm that broke that night was the sole cause of my depression. Our way lay through deep, high-banked lanes— and before we had gone very far I fell asleep, and was only awakened by the stopping of the motor, and with a sudden thrill, partly of fear, but chiefly of curiosity, I found myself standing in the doorway of my house of dream. We went, I half wondering whether or not I was dreaming still, through a low oak-panelled hall, and out onto the lawn, where tea was laid in the shadow of the house. It was set in flower-beds, a red brick wall with a gate in it bounded one side, and out beyond that was a space of rough grass with a walnut-tree. The façade of the house was very long, and at one end stood a three-storied tower, markedly older than the rest. Here for the moment all resemblance to the repeated dream ceased. There was no silent and somehow terrible family, but a large assembly of exceedingly cheerful persons— all of whom were known to me, and in spite of the horror with which the dream itself had always filled me, I felt nothing of it now that the scene of it was thus reproduced before me. But I felt intensest curiosity as to what was going to happen. T 
tea pursued its cheerful course, and before long Mrs. Clinton got up, and at that moment I think I knew what she was going to say. She spoke to me, and what she said was, "'Jack will show you your room. I have given you the room in the tower.' At that, for half a second, the horror of the dream took hold of me again, but it quickly passed, and again I felt nothing more than the most intense curiosity. It was not very long before it was amply satisfied. John turned to me. "'Right up at the top of the house,' he said. "'But I think you'll be comfortable. We're absolutely full up. Would you like to go and see it now? By Jove, I believe that you're right, and that we're going to have a thunderstorm. How dark it has become!' I got up and followed him. We passed through the hall and up the perfectly familiar staircase. Then he opened the door, and I went in. And at that moment sheer unreasoning terror again possessed me. I did not know what I feared. I, I simply feared. And like a sudden recollection, when one remembers a name which has long escaped the memory, I knew what I feared. I feared Mrs. Stone, whose grave with a sinister inscription in evil memory I had so often seen in my dream, just beyond the lawn which lay below my window. And then once more the fear passed so completely that I wondered what there was to fear, and I found myself sober and quiet and sane in the room in the tower, the name of which I had so often heard in my dream, and the scene of which was so familiar. I looked around it with a certain sense of proprietorship and found that nothing had been changed from the dreaming nights in which I knew it so well. Just to the left of the door was the bed, lengthways along the wall, with the head of it in the angle. In a line with it was the fireplace and a small bookcase. Opposite the door the outer wall was pierced by two lattice-paned windows, between which stood the dressing-table, while ranged along the fourth wall was the washing-stand and a big cupboard. My luggage had already been unpacked for the furniture of dressing and undressing lay orderly on the washstand and toilet-table, while my dinner-clothes were spread out on the coverlet of the bed. And then, with a sudden start of unexplained dismay, I saw that there were two rather conspicuous objects which I had not seen before in my dreams. One a life-sized oil-painting of Mrs. Stone, the other a black-and-white sketch of Jack Stone, representing him as he had appeared to me only a week before in the last of the series of these repeated dreams, a rather secret and evil-looking man of about thirty. His picture hung between the windows, looking straight across the room to the other portrait, which hung at the side of the bed. At that I looked next, and as I looked I felt once more the horror of nightmare seize me. It represented Mrs. Stone, as I had seen her last in my dreams, old and withered and white-haired, but in spite of the evident feebleness of body, a dreadful exuberance and vitality shone through the envelope of flesh, and exuberance wholly malign, a vitality that foamed and frothed with unimaginable evil. Evil beamed from the narrow, leering eyes, it laughed in the demon-like mouth. The whole face was instinct with some secret and appalling mirth. The hands clasped together on the knee seemed shaking with suppressed and nameless glee. Then I saw also that it was signed in the left-hand bottom corner, and wondering who the artist could be, I looked more closely and read the inscription, Julia Stone, by Julia Stone. There came a tap at the door, and John Clinton entered. "'Got everything you want?' he asked. "'Rather more than I want,' said I, pointing to the picture. He laughed. "'Heart-featured old lady,' he said. "'By herself, too, I remember. Anyhow, she can't have flattered herself much.' "'But don't you see?' said I. "'It's scarcely a human face at all. It's the face of some witch, of some devil.' He looked at it more closely. "'Yes, it isn't very pleasant,' he said. "'Scarcely a bedside manner, eh?' Yes, I can imagine getting the nightmare if I went to sleep with that close by my bed. I'll have it taken down, if you like. I really wish you would, I said. He rang the bell, and with the help of a servant we detached the picture and carried it out onto the landing, and put it with its face to the wall. By Jove, the old lady is awake, said John, mopping his forehead. I wonder if she had something on her mind. The extraordinary weight of the picture had struck me, too. I was about to reply— when I caught sight of my own hand. There was blood on it, in 
considerable quantities covering the whole palm. "'I've cut myself somehow,' said I. John gave a little startled exclamation. "'Why, I have too," he said. Simultaneously, the footman took out his handkerchief and wiped his hand with it. I saw that there was blood also on his handkerchief. John and I went back into the tower room and washed the blood off, but neither on his hand nor on mine was there the slightest trace of a scratch or cut. It seemed to me that, having ascertained this, we both, by a sort of tacit consent, did not allude to it again. Something in my case had dimly occurred to me that I did not wish to think about. It was but a conjecture, but I fancied that I knew the same thing had occurred to him. The heat and oppression of the air, for the storm we had expected was still undischarged, increased very much after dinner, and for some time most of the party, among whom were John Clinton and myself, sat outside on the path bounding the lawn, where we had had tea. The night was absolutely dark, and no twinkle of star or moon-ray could penetrate the pall of cloud that overset the sky. By degrees, our assembly thinned, the women went up to bed, men dispersed to the smoking or billiard-room, and by eleven o'clock my host and I were the only two left. All the evening I thought that he had something on his mind, and as soon as we were alone, he spoke. "'The man who helped us with a pitcher had, had blood on his hand, too, did you notice?' he said. I asked him just now if he had cut himself, and he said he supposed he had, but that he could find no mark of it. Now where did that blood come from? By dint of telling myself that I was not going to think about it, I had succeeded in not doing so, and I did not want, especially just at bedtime, to be reminded of it. I don't know, said I, and I don't really care so long as the picture of Mrs. Stone is not by my bed. He got up. But it's odd, he said. Ah, now you'll see another odd thing. A dog of his, an Irish terrier by breed, had come out of the house as we talked. The door behind us into the hall was open, and a bright oblong of light shone across the lawn to the iron gate, which led on to the rough grass outside, where the walnut tree stood. I saw that the dog had all his hackles up, bristling with rage and fright. His lips were curled back from his teeth, as if he was ready to spring at something, and he was growling to himself. He took not the slightest notice of his master or me, but stiffly and tensely walked across the grass to the iron gate. There he stood for a moment, looking through the bars and still growling. Then of a sudden his courage seemed to desert him. He gave one long howl and scuttled back to the house with a curious crouching sort of movement. "'He does that half a dozen times a day,' said John. "'He sees something which he both hates and fears.' I walked to the gate and looked over it. Something was moving on the grass outside, and soon a sound which I could not instantly identify came to my ears. Then I remembered what it was. It was the purring of a cat. I lit a match and saw the purrer, a big blue Persian walking round and round in a little circle just outside the gate, stepping high and ecstatically, with tail carried aloft like a banner. Its eyes were bright and shining, and every now and then it put its head down and sniffed at the grass. I laughed. "'The end of that mystery, I am afraid,' I said. "'He is a large cat having Valpurgis night all alone.' "'Yes, that's Darius,' said John. "'He spends half the day and all night there. But that's not the end of the dog mystery, for Toby and he are the best of friends, but the beginning of the cat mystery. What's the cat doing there?' And why is Darius pleased, while Toby is terror-stricken? At that moment I remembered the rather horrible detail of my dreams when I saw through the gate, just where the cat was now, the white tombstone with the sinister inscription. But before I could answer, the rain began as suddenly and heavily as if a tap had been turned on, and simultaneously the big cat squeezed through the bars of the gate, and came leaping across the lawn to the house for shelter. Then it sat in the doorway, looking out eagerly into the dark. It spat and struck at John with its paw as he pushed it in, in order to close the door. Somehow, with the portrait of Julia Stone in the passage outside, the room in the tower had absolutely no alarm for me, and as I went to bed, feeling very sleepy and heavy, I had nothing more than interest for the curious incident about our bleeding hands and 
the conduct of the cat and dog. The last thing I looked at before I put out my light was the square empty space by my bed where the portrait had been. Here the paper was of its original full tint of dark red. Over the rest of the walls it had faded. Then I blew out my candle and instantly fell asleep. My awaking was equally instantaneous, and I sat bolt upright in bed, under the impression that some bright light had been flashed in my face, though it was now absolutely pitch dark. I knew exactly where I was, in the room which I had dreaded in dreams, but no horror that I ever felt when asleep approached the fear that now invaded and froze my brain. Immediately after, a peal of thunder crackled just above the house, but the probability that it was only a flash of lightning which awoke me gave no reassurance to my galloping heart. Something I knew was in the room with me, and instinctively I put out my right hand, which was nearest the wall, to keep it away, and my hand touched the edge of a picture-frame, hanging close to me. I sprang out of bed, upsetting the small table that stood by it, and I heard my watch, candle, and matches clatter onto the floor. But for the moment there was no need of light, for a blinding flash leaped out of the clouds, and showed me that by my bed again hung the picture of Mrs. Stone. And instantly the room went into blackness again, but in that flash I saw another thing also, namely a figure that leaned over the end of my bed, watching me. It was dressed in some close-clinging white garment, spotted and stained with mould, and the face was that of the portrait. Overhead the thunder cracked and roared, and when it ceased and the deathly stillness succeeded, I heard the rustle of movement coming nearer me, and, more horrible yet, perceived an odour of corruption and decay. And then a hand was laid on the side of my neck, and close beside my ear I heard quick-taken, eager breathing. Yet I knew that this thing, though it could be perceived by touch, by smell, by eye, and by ear, was still not of this earth, but something that had passed out of the body and had power to make itself manifest. Then a voice, already familiar to me, spoke. "'I knew you would come to the room in the tower,' it said. "'I have been long waiting for you. At last you have come. Tonight I shall feast. Before long we will feast together.' and the quick breathing came closer to me. I could feel it on my neck. At that, the terror which I think had paralysed me for the moment, gave way to the wild instinct of self-preservation. I hit wildly with both arms, kicking out at the same moment, and heard a little animal squeal, and something soft dropped with a thud beside me. I took a couple of steps forward, nearly tripping up over whatever it was that lay there, and by the merest good luck found the handle of the door. In another second I ran out on the landing, and had banged the door behind me. Almost at the same moment I heard a door open somewhere below, and John Clinton, candle in hand, came running upstairs. "'What is it?' he said. "'I sleep just below you, and heard a noise as if—good heavens, there's blood on your shoulder!' I stood there, so he told me afterwards, swaying from side to side, white as a sheet— with a mark on my shoulder as if a hand covered with blood had been laid there. "'It's in there,' I said, pointing. "'She, you know. The portrait is in there, too, hanging up on the place we took it from.' At that he laughed. "'My dear fellow, this is mere nightmare,' he said. He pushed by me, and opened the door, I standing there, simply inert with terror, unable to stop him, unable to move. "'Phew! What an awful smell!' he said. Then there was silence. He had passed out of my sight behind the open door. Next moment he came out again, as white as myself, and instantly shut it. Yes, the portrait's there, he said, and on the floor is a thing, a thing spotted with earth, like what they bury people in. Come away, quick, come away. How I got downstairs I hardly know. An awful shuddering and nausea of the spirit rather than of the flesh had seized me, and more than once he had to place my feet upon the steps, while every now and then he cast glances of terror and apprehension up the stairs. But in time we came to his dressing-room on the floor below, and there I told him what I have here described. 
The sequel can be made short. Indeed, some of my readers have perhaps already guessed what it was, if they remember that inexplicable affair of the churchyard at West Forley, some eight years ago, where an attempt was made three times to bury the body of a certain woman who had committed suicide. On each occasion, the coffin was found in the course of a few days again, protruding from the ground. After the third attempt, in order that the thing should not be talked about, the body was buried elsewhere, in unconsecrated ground. Where it was buried was just outside the iron gate of the garden belonging to the house where this woman had lived. She had committed suicide in a room at the top of the tower in that house. Her name was Julia Stone. Subsequently, the body was again secretly dug up, and the coffin was found to be full of blood. The Believers by Robert Arthur This is it, Nick Dean said with enthusiasm, after he had stared down at the old Carraday house for a couple of minutes. This is what I had in mind, right down to the last rusty hinge and creaking floorboard. Danny Lomax heaved a sigh of relief. Praise be to Allah, he intoned. We've wasted almost a week finding a joint that suited you just right, and that doesn't leave us much time to start beating the drum. Although I'll admit— Danny squinted down at the brooding old pile of stone and lumber that still retained some traces of a one-time dignity. I'll admit you've really turned up a honey at last. If that ain't a haunted house, it'll do until one comes along. Nick Dean stood for a moment longer, appraising the Carraday Mansion, on whose arched entrance the carved figure 1784 still defied the corroding elements. The building was a long, L-shaped, colonial-type house, with stone foundations and hand-sawed clapboard upper structure. It had been painted some dark colour once, but the colour had gone with the years, leaving the structure a scabrous, mottled hue that had, to the eye of one who stared too long at it in the uncertain light of dusk, an unpleasant appearance of slow, sinuous movement. The building was two-storied, with attics, and seemed to contain a number of rooms. Woods, once cut back, had crept up almost to the walls, and though it was only second-growth stuff, pine and cedar, they gave the place a cramped, crowded feeling. A weed-grown dirt carriage drive connecting with a half-impassable county road that seemed never to be used any more, and the tumbled ruins of a couple of outbuildings finished off the scene. "'It has everything, Danny,' Nick Dean went on with animation. "'Absolutely everything but a ghost. Which is just fine and dandy with me.' The technical assistant allotted him by his radio hour sponsors, so pure soaps present dead danger with Dean, asserted. Of course, I don't believe in ghosts, as the hillbilly said about the hippopotamus, but that's all the more reason I don't want to go meeting one. <laughs> I'm too old to go around revising my beliefs just to please a spook. That's just it, Nick Dean told him. A resident haunt that somebody or other had seen, or thought he'd seen and described, would cramp my style. Of course, nobody comes out here, and it's spooky enough to make any casual passerby take another road, but there's no definite legend attached to it. And that's what I've been looking for. That, plus a proper background. And this has the proper background. Three generations of Carradays died here. Malaria, probably. Look at the swamp back there. The last Carraday ran away to sea and died in Java. The place has been empty fifteen years now, except for a tramp found in it one winter, dead of pneumonia. Nobody's gonna buy it. Not a way out here in a swampy section of woods and for a couple thousand dollars the estate agent will be glad enough to let us have the key and do anything we want to it, including furnishing it with a nice, <laughs> brand new ghost. Which is just what I'm gonna do, and believe me, it'll be a Lulu. Nicholas Dean, hand-tailored spooks, ghost maker to the nobility, Danny Lomax grunted. You know, I used to read your books and believe them. That chapter where you told about the doomed virgin dancing girl in the old temple at Anchor Wat and how you saved her just before the priest came for her gave me a big kick once. I was sap enough to think it had really happened. Well, there is a temple at Anchor Wat, Nick Dean grinned, and dancing girls, too. For all I know, one of them may be a virgin. So if you enjoyed the story, why complain? You believed it when you read it, didn't you? Yeah, Danny Lomax agreed, stamping out a cigarette. I believed it. Then you got your money's worth. 
The tall, bronzed man, sunlamp treatments every evening, carefully timed by his valet, Walters, kept that bronze in good repair, asserted. And a million people still believe it, just as five million people are going to believe in the Caraday curse. Okay, okay, the small, wiry man assented. I'm not here to argue. Let's scram. Even if the Caraday curse is strictly a Nick Dean phony, I, I don't like this dump in these shadows. If I had a lot of baby spooks I wanted to raise to be nice, big haunts, I'd bring them here and plant them. <laughs> the atmosphere is so unhealthy. Nick Dean grinned again. The flashing-toothed smile that had won him indulgence all around the globe had been photographed against the columns of the Athenaeum, halfway up Mount Everest, atop an elephant going over the Alps, and too many other places to list. He brushed back the jet-black hair that lay so smoothly against his skull, and started back toward the road from the little knoll they'd climbed to get a view of the house. Danny Lomax followed, making plans out loud. We can have him run a rebroadcast unit on a truck up to the road here, he decided. You'll have a portable sender on your back, and the truck will pick it up and retransmit to Hartford. Hartford will pipe it into New York and out through the networks. We'll give the equipment a thorough check, and there's not much chance of anything going wrong. Your Crosley rating has been falling off lately but this'll hype all the box office up to the top again. Most of your listeners have already read the stuff you've been dramatizing on the ether, you know. This one, a direct broadcast from a haunted house at night on Friday the 13th, will pull them in. You're a phony, Dean, but you got some good ideas, and this is one of the better ones. If. If what? Nick demanded challengingly as they reached the road and prepared to clamber into the gleaming roadster that had gotten them there. If you put it over, Danny Lomax took the right-hand seat and slammed the door. A lot of newspaper guys don't like you any too well. And if there's any stink to this thing, they'll horse laugh it to death. There's got to be a ghost, and your audience has got to believe in it. Don't make any mistake about that. There'll be a ghost. Nick Dean shrugged, putting the roadster into motion. And they'll believe in it. I'll be right in the room with them. I'm working on the script now. I'm going to ask them to turn out the light when they listen and imagine they're with me, waiting in the dark for the thing that for a hundred years has been the curse of the Caradays to appear. I'll be armed only with a flashlight, a Bible, and— And a contract, Danny interrupted. Sorry, don't mind my cynical ways. I was dropped from the social register on my head while still a babe. And a crucifix, Dean continued, a little nettled by now. They'll hear boards creaking, and a death watch beetle ticking in the wall, and plenty of other details. I'll make them up as I go along. Spontaneity always gives the most convincing effect, I've found. And they'll be convinced. Aren't they always? Yeah, the little advertising man agreed reluctantly. When you turn on the heat, old ladies swoon with excitement, and little kids scream all night in their cribs. There was one heart failure, an old maid in Dubuque, after last month's show, the one in which you were fighting an octopus forty feet beneath the surface, down in the Malay purling waters. There'll be half a dozen this time, Nick Dean prophesied complacently. When I start into the Caraday house to meet the thing with a face like an oyster. A face like an oyster, huh? Danny Lomax repeated and swallowed hard. That's what it's gonna look like? Nick Dean chuckled and nodded. If there's anything deader looking than a watery blue oyster that's been open too long, he said. I don't know what it is. Where was I? Oh, yes. Well, when I start into that house to wait for the approach of the thing with an oyster face, I'm gonna scare the living livers out of five million people. If you guys do your jobs right. We will, we will, Danny promised. We'll ship out photos of the house. I'll plant the story the locals should repeat to a couple of fellows in the village. We'll ballyhoo you all the way down the line. The only thing we won't do is try to fix the weatherman to make it a stormy night. You'll have to take your chances on that. It's generally foggy down here in the swamps at night, Dean replied, quite seriously. Fog is as good as a storm any time. Yeah, Danny Lomax acquiesced, twisting around to look down at the house in the hollow below, the road having taken them up a slope behind it. Fog was already forming in tenuous grey wisps, as the disappearance of the sun brought cool air currents rolling down into the swampy dell. They made a little dancing approach toward the empty, silent building that was quite unappetizing to anyone with a good imagination. Fog's good enough for me any time. You know, Dean, maybe it's a good thing you don't believe in spooks yourself. Maybe it is at that. 
Nick Dean grinned as they topped her rise, and the Caraday house disappeared from view. Maybe it is at that. It was not a foggy night, yet there were mists about the Caraday house as Danny Lomax, Nicholas Dean, and two newspapermen, Ken Blake and Larry Miller, prepared to enter it. Sitting as it did in the very bottom of a little glen, so that any cool, mist-producing air currents there might be would flow toward it, it was wrapped in pale vapour that danced and shifted in slow, stately movements. A quarter moon thrust a weak finger of radiance down into the woods. It was eleven o'clock, and time for dare danger with Dean to hit the ether with its special broadcast. Danny Lomax had earphones clamped to his ears, tentacles of wire trailing back from them to the broadcast truck pulled up beside the road on the little rise that overlooked the house. The house was four hundred yards away, and Danny Lomax was conscious of a vague regret it wasn't four million as he snatched off the earphones and dropped his hand. Nick Dean caught the signal, which meant that the theme song was finished, as well as the lengthy announcement outlining the circumstances of the broadcast from the New York studio. His deep, expressive voice took up the tale without a hitch. This is Nicholas Dean speaking, he said easily into the mic attached to his chest and connected to the pack broadcaster slung over his shoulder. The old Caraday mansion lies in a depression below me, some four hundred yards away. One moonlight illuminates it. Veils of fog wrap around it as if to hide it from man's gaze. For fifteen years, no human being has spent a night beneath its roof. Alive. His voice paused significantly, to let his unseen audience experience its first prickle of pleasurable terror. But tonight I'm going to brave the curse of the Caradays. I'm going to enter the house, and in the great master bedroom where three generations of Caradays died, I'm going to wait for the unknown thing that legends tell of to appear. I am going toward the house now, with two reputable newspapermen at my side. One of them has a pair of handcuffs, the other the key. They are going to cuff me to the sturdy bedposts of the ancient four-poster that can be seen through the window, dust-covered, in the master bedroom. That is to ensure that I shall not leave before midnight strikes, before this ill-omened Friday the 13th passes away into the limbo of the vanished days. Nick Dean's voice went on, rising and falling in carefully cadenced rows, doing little tricks to the emotions of listeners a mile, a thousand miles, three thousand miles away. He and Danny Lomax and the two reporters trudged on downhill toward the house. This was a last-minute inspiration of Nick Dean's, this handcuff business. The press had taken a somewhat scoffing note toward the stunt broadcast, but Nick Dean's showman instinct had risen to the occasion. There was a compellingness to the idea of a man being chained in a deserted house, haunted or not, being unable to leave, which had impressed the radio column writers. Dean kept on talking as they approached the old mansion, flashlight beams dancing ahead of them. He described the woods, the night sounds, the dancing mist, the appearance of the empty, silent mansion ahead of them, and did a good job. Not that it was necessary for the three men with him. Even before they reached the house, the carefully cultivated scepticism which Blake and Miller had sported was gone from their faces. Cynical though they were, Danny Lomax thought he could catch traces of uneasiness on their countenances. The place had that kind of an atmosphere about it. "'We are standing on the rotten, creaking porch now,' Dean was telling his audience. One reporter is unlocking the door with the key given us reluctantly by the white-haired agent for the property. A man whose expression tells us that he knows many things about this house his closed lips will not reveal. The door creaks open. Our lights probe the black throat of the hall. Dust is everywhere, seeming inches thick. It rises and swirls about us as we enter. They went in and Nick Dean's tread was the firmest of the four, as they strode the length of a narrow hall and reached the stairs. Their light showed side rooms, filled with old furniture, whose dust covers had not been removed in almost two decades. The stairs were winding and creaked. The air was as musty as it always is in houses long closed. They reached the upstairs, 
and a finger of moonlight intruded through an end window. Their flashlights reflected off a dusty mirror, and Larry Miller jumped uneasily. Nick Dean chuckled into the microphone, and a million listeners nodded in quick approval of his courage. My friends are nervous, Nick Dean was telling them. They feel the atmosphere that hangs so heavy in these silent rooms, trod only by creatures of the unseen. I do not blame them. I would feel nervous, too, if I did not have a complete belief in the inability of any spiritual creature to harm a living man. Their existence I do not deny. I do, instead, affirm it resolutely. But their harmlessness I am convinced of. We are now in the bedroom, where I shall wait. The bedroom was big. The door leading into it, though, was low and narrow, and the windows were small. A broken shutter hanging outside creaked ever so slightly in an unseen air current. There was a bureau, two old chairs, a cedar chest, a rag rug, and the four-poster bedstead. A coverlet, grey with dust, lay over the mattress. Nick Dean grimaced as he saw it, but his voice did not falter. Danny Lomax snatched the coverlet off the bed and shook it. Dust filled the air, and he coughed as he put the coverlet back into place. He slid a chair up beside the bed, and Nick Dean, without disturbing the broadcast, slid off his pack transmitter and placed it on the chair. He lay down on the bed, and Larry Miller, with a pair of handcuffs from his pocket, linked one ankle to the left bedpost. Danny Lomax adjusted the mic so that Nick Dean could speak into it without having to hold it, and Dean waved his hand in a signal of preparedness. "'My friends are preparing to depart,' he told his audience, and his words leaped from the room to the waiting truck, from there to Hartford, twenty miles away, and thence to New York, then to the world, or whatever part of it might be listening. "'In a moment I will be alone,' I have a flashlight, but to conserve the batteries, I'm going to turn it out. May I make a suggestion? Why do not you, who listen, turn out your lights too, and we will wait together in darkness for the approach of the creature known as the Curse of the Carides, a creature which I hope, before the next hour is over, to describe to you. What it is, or what it looks like, I do not know. The one man who could tell, the agent for the property, faithful to his trust, though the last Caraday died long since and far off Java, will not speak. Yet if the portents are favorable, we, you and I, may see it tonight. Clever, Danny Lomax thought, his trick of identifying the audience with himself, making them feel as if they were on the spot, too, one of the big secrets of his success. Now, Nick Dean was saying, I take my leave of my companions. Then Danny and the two reporters were leaving. Nick Dean kicked his leg, the chain of the handcuff rattled, and Larry Miller jumped. Nick waved a sardonic hand after them. They went downstairs, not dawdling, and no one spoke until they were outside. Then Blake drew a deep breath. He's a phony, he said with a reluctant admiration. And you know as well as I do that if he sees anything tonight— It'll be strictly the product of his imagination, or of that bottle in his coat pocket. But just the same, I wouldn't spend an hour in that joint handcuffed to the furniture for a month's pay. Without hesitating, they set off for the waiting truck, and the small knot of men, technicians, reporters, and advertising agency men, clustered around it. And as they hurried, in Boston, in Sioux Falls, Kalamazoo, Santa Barbara, and a thousand other towns— Lights went out in a house here, another there, as some of Nick Dean's far-flung audience obeyed his melodramatic suggestion to listen to him in the darkness. And two hundred thousand families settled themselves to wait with him, hanging on his every word, their acceptance of everything he said complete, their belief utter. When the three of them reached the rebroadcast truck again, the little group of half a dozen men there were clustered about the rear— where a half-circle of light burned through the darkness, and a loudspeaker repeated Nick Dean's every word. Dean was building atmosphere still. His resonant voice was picturing the house, the shadows, the dust, the darkness that seemed to crouch within the hallways. And as he spoke, not a man there but could see the pictures he evoked rising up before their eyes. Listen, Nick Dean was saying, 
and Danny Lomax could visualize the big bronze man grinning sardonically as he spoke. And hear with me the small night sounds that infest this ancient spirit-ridden dwelling. Somewhere a board is creaking, perhaps for no tangible cause. I cannot tell, but it comes to me clearly. Listening, they could hear it too. The eerie, chill-provoking creak of a floorboard or stairway in midnight silence. Nick Dean had two bits of wood in his pocket that he rubbed together to get that effect, but only Danny Lomax knew that, and even knowing, he did not like the sound. I hear the creaking. Nick Dean's voice was low, suspense-filled now. I hear the creaking. Something else. A monotonous tick, tick, tick that seems to become louder and louder as I listen to it. The frightening beat of the death watch beetle within the walls of this room. They could hear that too, as Nick Dean's voice died out. Hear it, and their own breathing became diminuendo, as if they too were in that room, listening with a man bound to the great four poster there. And in Atlanta, in Rochester, in Cincinnati, in Memphis, Mobile, Reno, Cheyenne, and a thousand other cities, a thousand other towns, a thousand other villages, in two hundred thousand homes, Nick Dean's listeners heard it too in the hushed silence with which they listened, and swallowed a little harder, looked about them a little uneasily, and smiled, smiles that were palpably artificial. And they believed. Danny Lomax would have believed, too, if he hadn't known of the small metal contrivance by which Nick Dean managed the Death Watch beetle noises. Even knowing, he admitted to himself that it was an impressive performance. When Nick Dean had boasted that he would make five million people believe in the curse of the Carradays, he had exaggerated, but not about their believing. His audience probably didn't number more than a million but he had that million by now in a complete state of acceptance for anything he might want to say next. Danny glanced at his watch, turning his wrist so that the timepiece caught the light. Thirty-five minutes gone. Twenty-five to go. Time now for Dean to start turning on the heat. Time for the sock punch to start developing. He'd built up his background, and sold his audience. Now he ought to begin to deliver. He did. A moment later, Nick Dean's voice paused abruptly. The sudden silence held more suspense than any words he could have spoken. It held for ten seconds, twenty, thirty. Then he broke it only with a half-whispered announcement. I think I can hear something moving outside the house. Around the sound truck, there was utter silence save for the whine of the generator that was pumping the broadcast over the hills and woods to Hartford. Whatever it is, Nick Dean's voice was still low, still that of a man who whispers an aside, even while intent upon something else. Whatever it is, it's coming closer. It seems to be moving slowly up from the small patch of swamp, just south of the house. Absently, Danny Lomax reached for a cigarette. Nick was sticking to the general script they'd outlined. Almost at the last minute, they'd decided against a spiritual manifestation, a ghost, pure and simple. Instead, with his usual instinct for getting the right note, Nick Dean had switched to a thing. Something nameless, something formless, something unclassifiable, something out of the night and the swamp and the unknown. Something that might be alive and might not be alive, but something that, when Nick Dean got through describing it, would be very, very real. Whatever it is, it's coming closer, Nick Dean reported then. I hear a dragging, dull sound, as of something heavy moving through dead brush and over rough ground. It may be just an animal, perhaps even a stray cow, or a horse, or a wild Pig escaped from a pen somewhere on an adjacent form. A million listeners held their breath a moment, then prepared to let it go. Of course, just a starving horse, or a cow, something warm, something familiar, something harmless. Then, 
It's pulling at the boards which cover the cellar windows, Nick Dean exclaimed. It's trying to get into the house. Danny Lomax held his cigarette unlighted until the flaring match burned his fingers. In spite of their determined skepticism, there was an intentness to the faces of the reporters and technicians gathered around the end of the sound truck. They knew or guessed this was a phony. Yet the sudden jolt, after Dean had given their nerves a moment in which to relax, got them all, just as it was getting the whole great unseen audience. Danny Lomax, from years of listening to radio programs behind the scenes, had developed a sixth sense of his own. He could tell almost to a degree just how a program was going over whether it was smashing home or laying an egg. He could feel the audience that listened reacting, and he could sense what their reactions were. Now something was pulling at him, something strained and tense and uneasy. A million people or more was listening, were believing, were living through the scene with Nicholas Dean, and crouched there in the chilly night beside the broadcast truck. Danny Lomax could feel the waves of their belief sweeping past him, impalpable, but very real. Nick Dean's voice had quickened. He was reporting now the sound of nails shrieking as they pulled free, as boards gave way. He described a heavy, squashy body forcing its way through the tiny window. He made his listeners hear the soft, squashy sounds of something large and flabby moving through the darkness of the cellar of the house, finding the stairs— going up them slowly, slowly, slowly. Now it's in the hall. The big man's words were short, sharp, electric. It's coming toward the door. I hear boards creaking beneath its weight. It senses that I'm here. It's searching for me. I confess I'm frightened. No sane man could fail to be. However, I'm convinced it can't hurt me. If it's a psychic manifestation, it's harmless however horrifying its appearance may be. So I am keeping a firm grip on my nerves. Only if they betray me can I be endangered, and they will not betray me. Whatever it is, it's just outside the doorway now. I can sense it looking in at me. The room is in darkness. The moon is set. I have my flashlight, though, and I'm going to turn it full on the thing in the doorway. I can smell a musty, damp odor, as of swamps and, and wet places. It is very strong, almost overpowering. But now I'm going to turn on the light. Nick Dean's voice ceased. Danny Lomax's wristwatch ticked as loudly as an alarm clock. The seconds passed. Ten. Twenty. Thirty. Forty. Someone shifted position. Someone's breath was rasping like that of a choking sleeper. Then— it's going. Nick Dean's voice was a whisper. It looked at me, and would have entered. I could sense what it wished. It wished me. But I have the Bible and crucifix I brought tightly in my hand. The light has been shining full into its... its face, if I can call it that. I did not lower my gaze, and now it's going. I can no longer see it. The light of my flash falls on the black empty frame of the doorway. It is slithering back down the hall, toward the steps. It is returning to the swamp from which it came, when it sensed my presence here. I can hardly describe it. I, I don't know what it was. It stood as high as a man, yet its legs were only stumps of grayness, without feet of any kind. Its body was long and bulbous, like a misshapen turnip its flesh grayish and uneven. It shone a little, as if with slime, and I saw droplets of water on it catch the light of my torch. It had a head, a great round head that was as hairless as the rest of it, and a face, ah, I cannot make you see it as I saw it. Staring into it, I could only think of an oyster, a monstrous, wet, blue-gray oyster with two darker spots that must have been eyes. It had arms. At least two masses of matter attached to either side of its body reached out a little toward me. There were no hands on the end of them, just strings of corruption. That was all I could see. 
Then it turned. Now it is gone. It has reached the bottom steps, going down with a shuffling, bumping noise. It is moving toward the cellar stairs, the floor creaking beneath it, back to the cellar window through which it forced itself, back to the depths of the swamp from which it emerged. Yet the sense of it still hangs in this room, and I know that if my will should slacken, it could feel it and return, but it must not. I will not let it. It must return to the bottomless muck from which it came. Danny Lomax touched his dry lips with his tongue. This was it. This was the high spot. This was where Nick Dean got over or fell flat on his face. Danny knew that whichever it was, he'd be able to sense it. And he did. Not failure. Success. The unseen currents that eddied around him were belief. The belief of a million people— wrapped in a skein spun of words, the belief of a million listeners seeing in their minds something that had never existed, but which Nick Dean had created and put there. Tomorrow they might laugh, they might belittle and ridicule the very fact they had listened, but they'd never be able to forget how they had felt, and now, for the moment at least, they believed. Danny let out her breath and looked at his watch. Almost midnight. Nick Dean was speaking again. It's gone now. It's outside again, seeking the swamp from which it came. This is Nicholas Dean speaking. I'm going to sign off now. I've been through quite a nerve strain. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'm glad that you weren't disappointed that something happened tonight to make this broadcast worth your listening. Good night, all. This is Nicholas Dean saying good night. Danny Lomax saw the chief of the rebroadcast crew throw a switch and nod to him. He leaned forward, toward a secondary mic in the truck, slipping on a pair of headphones. All right, Nick, he said. You're off the air. We're coming down to unlock you now. Okay, Nick Dean's voice came back, a little ragged. Hurry, will you? I'm getting sick of it here. The last couple of minutes I could swear I have heard noises outside. Maybe I'm too good. I'm believing myself. How'd it go? Went fine, Danny told him. They ate it up. A million people are sitting in their parlors this minute, getting the stiffness out of their muscles and trying to pretend they didn't believe you. I told you they would. Dean's voice was momentarily complacent. Then it became edged again. Listen, hurry, will you? Damn it, there is something moving around outside this house. You say they ate it up? Straight, Danny Lomax told him. I could feel it. They're all still seeing that thing you described, with the oyster face, crawling in through the cellar window, slithering up the stairs, standing in your doorway. Cut it, Dean ordered abruptly. And come down here. I'm... There's something coming in the cellar window where we loosen the boards for the reporters to find. Lomax turned. Oh, Joe, he called to the driver. Take the truck down in front of the house, will you? Save walking. What did you say then, Nick? I missed it. I said there's something coming in the cellar window. Nick Dean's voice was almost shrill. It's knocking around in the cellar. It's, it's coming toward the stairs. Steady, Nick, steady, Danny Lomax cautioned. Don't let your nerves go now. You and I know it's just a gag. Don't go and— Mother of heaven! Dean's breath was coming in gasps. Danny could hear it whistle into the mic at the other end of the two-way hookup. There's something coming up the stairs. Come and get me out of here. Danny looked up, a frown between his eyes. Joe, get going, will you? He snapped, and the driver looked around in annoyed surprise. Right away, he grunted, and the truck jerked forward. This fast enough to suit you? Danny Lomax didn't answer. Nick, you all right? He demanded of the mic, and Dean's voice, almost unrecognizable, came back. Danny, Danny. It gobbled. There's something coming up the stairs with a sort of thump, thump. I can smell marsh gas and, and ammonia. There's something making a slithery sound. <laughs> I tell you, something has got into this house from the swamp and is after me. The truck was jolting in second down the long, unused road. The reporters had swung on. They were staring at Danny, sensing something. They didn't know what going wrong. Danny, the earphones tight, hung over the mic. Take it easy, take it easy, he soothed. 
Just had one drink too many, Nick. We wrote all that down. It's just on paper. You just said it. A million people believed it, but you and I don't have to, Nick. We— Christ! Nick's cry was a prayer, not a curse. There's something in the hall. Something that scrapes and thumps. The floorboards are creaking. Danny, don't you know I'm chained here and it's coming after me? It is! It is! Nick Dean's voice was hysterical. It's at the doorway! It's— The voice was drowned out by a scraping of gravel as the track's brakes went on abruptly. Wheels fought for traction, lost it. A muddy spot underfoot had slewed the broadcast track to one side. The long, untended road gave no hold. The rear wheels slid toward the ditch beside the road and in. The track jolted, toppled, was caught as the hubs dug into a clay bank. The newspapermen were jolted off. Danny Lomax was bounced away from the mic, his earphones torn off his head. He scrambled back toward the mic, pulling himself up against the slant of the body. The earphones were cracked. He threw a switch, cutting in the speaker. Nick! he cried. Nick! In the doorway now! came the terror-shrill wail from the speaker. Coming in! Oyster face! Great, blank, watery oyster face! Danny, Danny, put me back on the air. Tell them all it's just a joke. Tell them it isn't so. Tell them not to believe, not to believe. Danny, do you hear? Tell them not to believe. It's coming in. It wants me. It smells, and it's all wet and watery, and it's face, it's face. Danny, tell them not to believe. It's cause they believe. It didn't exist. I thought it up. But they all believed me. You said they did. A million people all believing at the same time, believing strong enough for you to feel. They've made it, Danny. They, they've brought it to life. It's doing just what I said it did, and it looks just like I... I like... I, I, Danny, help me! Help me! The speaker screamed, vibrated shrilly at the overload, and was silent. And in the sudden hush, an echo came from the night. No. Not an echo, but the scream itself they had been hearing. Faint and dreadful it reached them, and Danny Lomax was quite unable to move for an instant, but stretched on and on as he listened. Then he galvanized into life, and as he darted into the darkness the others followed. With horrifying abruptness, Nick Dean's faint screams had ceased. He could see the Caraday house ahead, dark, silent, tomb-like. It was three hundred yards away, and the curve of the road. They couldn't go through the brush in black night, hid it momentarily. The three hundred yards took almost a minute. Then Danny, gasping, turned into the old carriage drive. Nick Dean's words still screamed in his mind. They've made it, Danny. They, they've brought it to life. A million people all believing at the same time. Could? Could? His mind wouldn't ask itself the question or answer it, but he had felt the currents of belief. In two hundred thousand homes a million people had sat and listened and believed, believed, and in the concentrated power of their believing, had they stirred some spark of force into life, had they gelled into the form of their belief a creature that— Feet pounded behind him. Someone had a flashlight. The beam of it, thrown out ahead, stabbed the night. It played over the house— and for a moment darted into the darkness beyond, and to one side. And Danny Lomax caught a glimpse of movement, a vague, grey-white glimmer of motion, a half-seen shape that moved with speed through the dense vegetation toward the half-acre swamp south of the house, and for an instant shone faintly, as if with slime and wetness. If there was any sound of movement, Danny Lomax did not hear it, because the scuffle of running feet and the hoarse breathing of running men behind drowned it out. But as he listened intently, he thought he heard a single scream, muffled and cut abruptly short, as though a man had tried to cry out with his mouth almost covered by something wet and soft and pulpy. Danny Lomax pulled up and stood quite still, as the newspapermen and technicians came up with him and ran past. He scarcely heard them, was scarcely aware of them, 
for his whole body was cold. Something was squeezing his insides with a giant hand, and he knew that in just an instant he was going to be deathly sick. And he knew already that the bedroom upstairs was empty, that the searchers would find only half a handcuff hanging from the footboard of the bed, its chain twisted in two, some marks in the dust, and a few drops of slimy water to tell where Nick Dean had gone. Only those, and an odour hanging pungent and acrid in the halls. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.